Thank you for tuning in to KNS Society Talk Live. Um, KNS Society Talk Live is brought to you by Honesdale Cinema and Honesdale PA. New screens, comfortable seating, cheap prices, and all the new movies for your entertainment viewing needs. If you're in your Honesdale, Pennsylvania area, visit Honesdale Cinema and Route 6 Plaza at Honesdale PA. Also brought to you by Ultra Toxic Television. It's not art, it's exploitation. Ultra Toxic Television, you can view on any streaming device and local um, by going to myvidportal.com. Once again, it's my, myvidportal.com. It's vile. It's disturbing. It's offensive. It's ultra toxic television. Now banned in over 10 countries. Ultra toxic television. Only on Roku. Get it at myvidportal.com. That's myvidportal.com. Ultra toxic television. It's not art, it's exploitation. Dipping in the pond. I didn't see anything. It was probably nothing. There is something out there. Don't forget, I have rented out every single horror film on videotape. It's driving me crazy. There's no need to worry. What are we talking about here? Those things that pop out of your stomach when you least expect it? Yes, I think you've seen some of these too. There's no need to fear. There's nothing out there. That's where the rest of the chicken was. There's nothing out there. Except it, like everyone else, takes a mouthful of shaving cream. Oh, this can't be so. Oh, you're quick. Nice bikini. This stuff only happens in movies. And you're saying we're in a movie? Uh oh. Well, where the hell did he go? Oh, oh, oh. She looks into his eyes. This thing hasn't missed a trick. Controls mind, eats people, reproduces. This thing's gonna have itself an orgy. It's a fight to the death with a slimy mutation. Ooh. And that's how I spent my summer vacation. I see the creature. Give him my best. There's nothing out there. Well, this is a fun vacation, Nick. Too bad we have to go home now. From 20-year-old filmmaker Ralph Kineski. And welcome to KNS Society Talk Live. I am your host, the Don, joined by Lucian Toombs and Peter Orton. Everybody. What's up, guys? How are you guys doing? And we're going to be joined now by the great director, Ralph Kaninsky, who made great films such as There's Nothing Out There, Party Bust to Hell, The Black Room, and he'll be joining us right now. Uh, hi, guys. <clears throat> How you doing, welcome Ralph? Back. Okay, pretty good. A uh, huge fan of your films. I I mean, it's just awesome. I just got done watching There's Nothing Out There twice since I got the Blu-ray in this week. 
amazing job they did to that film. Um, and it's great to have you on the show tonight. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So, Mr. Kaminsky, um, filmmaking, it seems like you started out in, when you were 21, correct? That's when uh, you directed and wrote There's Nothing Out There Now. Um, it seems like you had a, a passion for films, even going back earlier to than that. Is that, is that can I be true on that one? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I made Nothing Out There when I was 20. Um, I, uh, yeah, I pretty much fell in love with films when I discovered Abbey Costello movies. My father introduced me to uh, the world of Abbey Costello, the comedians from the 40s, and uh, Abbey Costello Frankenstein, being one of the, still one of the great comedy horror films, uh, sort of put me on the track, and then I got a video camera when I was 13, and at that point, it was kind of, that was it. <laughs> And uh, the, your credits, I mean, they go up to even to today and beyond, you're, you're making films, you're either writing them, directing them. I mean, it's just uh, an ongoing process. You brought us a lot of great, great um, cult classics that became uh, a lot of fun films as well. Um, Potty Bus to Hell was an amazing film. Um, you also you had to work with, uh, get to work with the lovely and beautiful um, uh, woman in that film, which was uh very successful. Also, um, what were some of your um, highlights when you were making There's Nothing Out There? Like, did you see yourself going this far in your career with making pictures? Well, um, There's Nothing Out There was, was my first professional film. I had done two feature-length films in high school, actually, uh, building up to this, because I known I wanted to become a filmmaker better when I was 14. So I was kind of trying to do something uh, by the age of 20. I was a big fan of Steven Spielberg as, as well as others. And he had done his first at 21 with the night gallery episode. So, uh, I was kind of trying to see what would be a good, uh, calling card for my career. And at, at that time in the, uh, in the late eighties, uh, horror was huge. I mean, it was everywhere, the video stores, the magazines, there was Fangoria as well as horror fan and slaughterhouse and, uh, gore zone. I mean, there were just, it was, so I felt that, you know, and, and researching it, you know, Spielberg had started with uh, Duel and Something Evil and Night Gallery, and uh, Coppola had started with Dementia 13, Oliver Stone with uh, Seizure and The Hand. So horror was kind of the uh, inroad for first-time filmmakers. So I decided I was, if I was going to do a horror film, I was going to uh, learn the genre, and I started renting out every movie on video and uh, became a fan of it while I watched it all and a uh, few you know, like Evil Dead stood out and Halloween stood out and the early uh, Peter Jackson, Bad Taste, uh, you know, but um, there were a lot of bad films, too, that were just capitalizing off of the genre success. So uh, nothing out there was... hope. I was hoping it would open the doors to get me into the business at the same time. I was... Uh, I kind of wanted to do something different than just the same old horror films, so that's how I came up with the idea of having a character who has seen every horror film like me and knows all the warnings and rules of how to survive a horror film, and I thought that would make it kind of interesting and different. So I, I thought horror fans would really appreciate that, that you know, someone finally commenting on, you know, don't go into the basement by yourself and don't drop the knife and don't go skinny dipping alone and all the cliches that get you killed. So that's where Mike in the movie came in, and um, the film took on its uh, comedic turn. <laughs> It also, um, Wes used that same principle uh, in a way of his character in Scream with uh, the horror fanatic and also, but you uh, predecessing Wes with your film would have to say you're the one that came up with that whole um, character development in some way. Yes, a, a Scream, obviously, well, when, when there's nothing out there finally came out, we, we, uh, it took a while to get the film sold because we finished the film, we shot the film in, 18, in 1989, and the film was ready in 90, but sort of at that point is when the horror uh, genre collapsed. Um, Tremors came out. It was didn't, They didn't know how to sell it. It didn't do well. The, the first one, uh, Nightbreed, was sold as a slasher film, and, and the genre sort of fell apart a little bit. It wasn't until Scream that it came back, but I was saying, because I was showing the film at film festivals and touring around, and I realized that the audiences were really enjoying the film, so I, I thought, you know, if someone comes along and makes a film, like this with a big enough budget and some name actors, I think it's going to make a fortune. Um, and then six years later when Scream finally came out, it, I proved I was on the right track. But I wasn't the first. Uh, I've said, too, that you know, uh, going back to 
having you sell me Frankenstein, and then of course there were more airplane-like parodies like uh, Student Bodies and Pandemonium and, uh, you know, Class Reunion and, and National Lampoons and things like that. There was also Evil Laugh and, um, and of course, I loved American Wealth in London and Fright Night, where there was a, a knowledge, but they didn't go as, as far as I did into the meta, I guess. So uh, I guess I was one of the first meta films like that. But it was a, a very fun film to watch, um, very enjoyable. I'm also joined by a host, uh, Peter Alden, who is a huge fan of cinema, and also yours, and also joined by Lucian Toombs. Um, Peter, do you have a question for Mr. Kaninsky? Yeah, you know, I'm going to ask kind of an obscure question, because um, I've always been kind of a, I've always been a kind of a Jeff Fahey fan, uh, especially from his uh, role from Body Parts uh, in 1991. I always thought that was a very underrated uh film directed by Eric Red. Talk to me about working with Jeff, uh, Jeff A. I mean, he worked with some great actors, but he really stands out as uh, one of those unsung heroes of acting. And just tell me about how it was working with him. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Jeff was great. Uh, the film itself, Corpses, that I directed a kind of zombie zombie comedy. I, I call it a zombie um, comedy horror film. Um, you know, it was we had a lot of issues on that movie with the company that had produced it, but, uh, yeah, basically they wanted, um, they wanted a name, they wanted somebody who was a name in the film <laughs> and they gave me a list. This is York entertainment that had produced a lot of low budget films and stuff at scarecrow with Tiffany Shepard and uh, some of the other ones. Uh, uh, but they didn't want to go into SAG at that point. So there were a few actors who were the financial core who could do it or agreed to do it. Um, and, but they were also like, they gave me a list of like, Monica Lewinsky and uh, <laughs> um, Siegfried and Roy and Pete Rose, people that were in the news that weren't actors. I was like, I looked at the list, and there were only two actors that I said, well, these are actor actors, which was Jeff Fahey and uh, Gary Busey. <clears throat> and oh, Gary God. Busey, I had heard stories at that point already from you know his kind of craziness. So I went with Jeff Jeff Fahey, and uh, he agreed to do it. He liked the script. He thought it was fun. I didn't actually get to meet him until the first day on the set, uh, but it was cool because. Um, since the the film didn't arrive, we we actually shot this on 35 millimeter film uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. um, we were sitting around waiting for the film to show up, so I got to talk to him for a few hours, and we saw eye to eye on the character, and he turned out to be great. He was he really enjoyed the film. He uh, he got the he got the character. He knew what he was doing, um, and he we 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 became friends on the movie. <clears throat> he. Um, I remember one time we were we were shooting in the alley scene and we had to like move some mats around for the person who's lying dead on the ground and Jeff was there moving the mat and and someone said Jeff you you don't have to do that and he goes hey I wasn't always an actor you know so he was like he pitched in and helped the crew <laughs> uh, which was great and then um, I actually talked into him a little bit about um, well Psycho three of course which I love and um, uh, Silverado. And uh, there was one cool thing in, in the movie in Corpses where he has a cigar in his mouth towards the end. And I, I, at one point I told him he should spit out the cigar before he kills this, uh, this uh, zombie. And he said, well, you know, um, when I did this movie Silverado, I was wearing this hat. And at one point I was riding with the horse and the hat flew off. And I said, you know, I don't think the hat should ever leave his head because that's his sort of trademark. That's who he is. But um, the d director, who was Lawrence Kasdan at the time, said, don't worry about it, it's fine. And then when they finished the film, Lawrence Kasdan said, you're right, you're right about the hat, you should never have lost the hat. So he told me that story with the cigar, and I said, okay, keep the cigar. And, uh, yeah, so that was, that was a really cool thing. And, and, then, and then it was really nice because th there were, as I said, problems on the shoot of that movie due to budgetary and many other <laughs> reasons, producer issues. Um, we there was a key scene in the movie that we didn't get to shoot, uh, and Jeff, they wanted him to record the lines just wild, and that we were gonna he was gonna double man, but he said he really couldn't do it. You know, he said, look, you know, you'll probably have to do a pickup on this movie at some point, so I can give you one day, but I can't give you two. So figure out what you need, and, and he w was willing to come back. So what it turned out is they shot the scene in a weird way, but. I called him and asked him to come in during post-production to do the voice because they just were going to say, get someone to do a sound like of him. And I was like, well, that's garbage. So uh, Jeff came back and did the ADR and didn't charge for that, and that was really nice. So, so he, he was a pleasure to work with. You actually mentioned something really interesting there um, where you were saying, you know, this, this film was shot in 35 millimeter. And looking back on your filmography, 
Uh, you started back in the 90s, the early 90s. And so a lot of the films that you shot probably uh, pre-2007 was 35 or 16 millimeter, uh, maybe some video pieces, I'm not sure. But talk to me about that transition because, you know, you were talking about low budget. We were, no, we were going over budget. Talk to me about that tra- uh, transition from 35 to 16, and now we're in a totally different filming age of digital. Was, what kind of – how did it – how were you affected by it? Do you prefer, uh, you know, going the celluloid way, or do you are you just embracing the digital era? Sure, sure. Well, okay. So, like I said, I got I got a video camera when I was fourteen back in the early eighties, and you know, had my and it was the video camera connected to the VCR. And then you had the <laughs> cord going from one deck to another, so you had to lug the the whole deck around as you're recording onto you know full size videotape. So I, I, I suffered through that, you know, doing that as, as a kid. And um, when I finally, you know, got into college, I did some Super 8 shorts that were finished on video. And then nothing out there was shot on Super 16. And then we blew it up to 35, <clears throat> which was cool. Um, and then my next film was shot on 35 millimeter. And then I did a lot of 16 and 35s. And then just as I did a film that I'm very proud of that no one has ever seen, unfortunately, called Tomorrow by Midnight, um, which was 1999, with uh, Alexis Arquette and Carol Kane and Jorge Garcia as one of my, it's sort of a dark comedy thriller. <clears throat> um, we shot an anamorphic, you know, two, three, five widescreen, 35 millimeter, oh, wow. and did the whole thing. Like I said, okay, this like is a movie, everything? and I was like, okay, this is this is this finally I finally made it to like this is what a movie movie is, and that was exactly around the time when the Blair Witch Project came out, and then suddenly everything changed. And it all became yeah. digital, and I was like, "No, I, I just got to film finally. I'm not, now everything is going back to, to when I was 14." Wow. Um, so I kind of fought it for a while because the, the issue was that if you were shooting now, the, the, the technology is so good, you, it's really hard to tell they can do it great. But you still have to, even if you're shooting digital, you have to light it properly. If you just light it flat, it looks like bad TV. You know, it looks like just it looks it, it looks like garbage. So. You really have to spend the time to make sure it looks good, digital or film. And um, at the time, you know, it, it took just as much effort. But of course, it was a lot cheaper than film stock. So I didn't. I did my first film in uh, on digital. Was I think Jacqueline Hyde was the first time I went to his corpse. And what was that? Um, Jacqueline Hyde was uh, 2004, I think. Okay. Because Corpses was was just before that. I shot them kind of almost back to back. And one was like short ends, 35 millimeter, which since it was a low budget, which was a nightmare. Short, short ends, which nobody has to worry about anymore, um, was when you're shooting film and you had a really low budget, they would, uh, a, a film reel, which was like 10 minutes, sometimes wouldn't shoot the entire reel. So they would they would save the end of the film and then that would go into like a pile and you could buy these short ends. So... They they would last. You don't know how long they'd last, but you, they were cheaper than shooting a whole reel of new 35 or, or 60 millimeter film. And we were shooting on these things. You know, so we're trying to do like three minute shots that the, the film would run out after 30 seconds. So it's like, well, how can I do a take if the film is running off? Out, out you know, it's just <laughs> it's very frustrating. So uh, I, I I like that that we went to digital that we didn't have to worry about takes because also with film you'd have to circle takes to decide which ones you wanted to print because the printing of the film process was so expensive. And it's like if you're shooting pieces of everything, I like. I said, well, I need a piece of take one, a piece of take two, a piece of take three because I came from editing background and I knew the stuff I needed to make it work together, but I, I like to have my footage in front of me. So digital, at least, it's all there. You, you know, There's no worry about m- missing something unless you make a mistake on the chip and you don't uh, uh, download the footage <laughs> and then you tape over the footage you shot, which has happened once or twice when it's poorly run. And then you're like, well, that was, well, we shot that day and we just threw it away. You know, um, that doesn't usually happen. Sometimes a shot or two will happen, but um, so now I've embraced it and I still love 35. I think if you have enough money, it'd be great to do 35 millimeter, but uh, with a very good DP and I've been lucky enough to work with some very good DPs. Um, it, it can look, it can look wonderful. So, uh, so the last few, bunch of films I've done I think have have looked great even though they're they're digital and not film yeah definitely digital has come a long way and it's funny that you mentioned that in 2004 and you kind of alluded to it earlier it was kind of a growing pain uh, situation in the in in the fact that a lot of people were so used to shooting on film that you're 100% right it was so different to actually like digital 
so uh, yeah, it, it was very difficult at first, but now it's like it's like you said earlier. It's just it's it's getting harder and harder to tell. Um, yeah. It's come a long way, but you know it is it is nice to see some celluloid here and there. Uh, it's good to see filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino do it, but like you said earlier, it's so much money. It, yeah, yeah. If you have the money, great, you know. But if you don't, then yeah, there, there's you. And really, only a few filmmakers can get away with it these days. Yes, yes. Spielberg still does, and uh, you know, uh, Peter Nol, you know, uh, Chris Nolan, and uh, yes. <laughs> And um, you, uh, like during your filmmaking career, uh, you didn't just stick with horror. You uh, went off into different other realms of filmmaking, like you created a, a great fun series of Emmanuel 2000, Emmanuel Through Time and such, which they had a, uh, quite a bit of followings as well. Um, you did like six of them, didn't you? Oh, you more. <laughs> I oh, did two on some of them. I did, I did a whole bunch. Um, but, yeah, well – uh, I, I'm from New York, and I, I moved out to California after my first two films, There's Nothing Out There, and uh, My Family Treasure, a kid's film, family film. And then um, I, basically I had to start from scratch when I got out here because neither film uh, was a big hit. Again, Nothing Out There over the years turned into a cult movie, but back then it was just you know a low-budget movie that got good reviews and people liked, but it didn't open any doors for me. So... Uh, I had to start again, and um, I was, uh, you know, about three years in California. I got a few, I, got, I did a writing, I, I wrote on a, a low-budget action movie called Red Line with uh, Michael Madsen and Chad McQueen. I did a rewrite of that and a few little odd jobs here and there. But um, uh, I was trying to find, uh, you know, the next job, and then I went to the American film market where a French producer named uh, Alain Saritsky was there, and he had produced the original Manuels and this whole series, and he was announcing a um, a new slate of films based on the, these Milo Manara comic books that are um, his famous artist who had worked with Fellini, but he also did these adult uh, graphic novels called uh, the, the Le Click and Butterscotch. And um, I actually knew of the comics because I discovered them through something else. So I went into his room and I told him I'm a filmmaker and I could do this. And he was impressed with there's nothing out there and uh, hired me. And that's how I got involved in the world of, Emmanuel and these late night, they were kind of, I call them like sexy comedies because um, I added a lot of humor to the flavor and luckily we shared the same sense of humor so we uh, we got along well and I worked on and off with Saritsky for about 16, 17 years. Um, but I was determined to, you know, I, I mean, it was fun doing the films and I got to do a James Bond parody, which I'm very proud of with Robert Donovan, who I've worked with many times, called Rod Steele, uh, You Only Live Until You Die. And I made a sequel years later called Today is Yesterday, Tomorrow. I'm a big Bond fan. Um, so that was, that was fun. And then uh, and even I got to do a musical uh, later towards the end, uh, which got released as Adventures into the Woods, a full-out, all-singing, all-dancing, all-naked musical. <laughs> kind of an homage to the uh, late 70s when they did uh, Charlie Vance, Cinderella, and Alice in Wonderland, and fairy tales. And so... I, I played around with it, but then I also got him to produce a movie like Tomorrow by Midnight, which was a straight, you know, dark comedy thriller about four kids that take a video store hostage for the night, and uh, Pretty Cool, which was a American Pie esque teen comedy. So um, it was a it was a good relationship, but uh, yeah, a lot of the Emmanuel movies. Is, the problem is if you do too many of those, and people don't know the difference between soft erotica and you know hardcore pornography. I never did pornography, but. You know, people don't know the difference between the two, so you get into a danger zone. And if people think you're an adult director, then you know that could kill your career. So, luckily, I've been able to do every kind of genre, from family films to lifetime thrillers to horror films, and jump around. And you know, I've never been uh, too pigeonholed into one certain thing. Although, if people want to compliment me, they talk about my broad range. If people want to knock me, they talk about all the the adult films or the the soft erotic films that I've done. To make me look like that kind of filmmaker. <laughs> yeah, no, there was a yeah. You did a large range of different films. Um, now, did you find it uh, easier to direct and to write horror than it was to go into the other territories of filmmaking with the other films? Um, was that your passion with with horror, or was it just uh, well, starting? Just I love. I mean, I, like I said, I, I I was scared of horror. I had real bad nightmares. The the nineteen seventy nine invasion of the body snatcher movie terrified me with uh, Donald Sutherland. Um, so I sort of had that love hate thing with horror that I had, you know, they scared me, but I was always attracted to 
them as well, like the Abbey Stella movies and Fright Night and American Wealth in London and then those movies. So comedy hard always was sort of involved with that. And I like that line where you're where you're balancing, you know, you're laughing and then you're jumping when it's done great, you know, when it, it's it's wonderful. So that was an attraction to me. But then after there's nothing out there, like I said, the market kind of dried up for a while. So I, you know, I, I had written a bunch of horror films, and my my next film I was planning to do was a horror film after there's nothing out there, but I couldn't raise the money for it. So uh, I did a family film, and then when I met Saritsky, it was all that late night HBO Cinemax stuff. So these were all sexy comedies. So I didn't get to go back to horror until Scream, because really when Scream came in, the genre came back. And that's when people started saying, well, you should do uh, a remake of There's Nothing Out There or, or a sequel or something like that. And I'm like, well, I, I don't want to kind of copy what they did, copying what I did, copying what they did, you know. So um, <clears throat> I, but I had written a, a script called The Hazing that originally started as potentially being Hell Night 2, if you know that movie, the Linda Blair film. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. yeah. um, I was... I was dealing with the producer Joe Wolf, who had produced one of the producers on Halloween and Nightmare on Elm Street, as well as Hell Night. And I was trying to get that going. It didn't happen. But um, I convinced Saritsky to almost produce the movie at the time because I, I used the old um, Roger Corman approach uh, when he did Little Shop of Horrors. I said, well, you know, what if we build a really good set and we do two different movies on the same set? One can be like a sexy movie and the other one can be a horror film. And after Scream, it was like, well, the market is big again. So he said, okay. And we started casting and, and we built the set, but he couldn't get the pre-sales in Europe because that's where he found his money uh, for a horror film because Scream hadn't really hit in Europe yet. So we made the sexy movie, but he didn't make the horror movie, and it took years before I finally got the hazing produced. But once I did, then I came back strong, and I did the hazing and corpses and Jacqueline Hyde. And you know, and then I, then I moved away from it again because – Nothing was really happening. I did other genres, and then recently, the last three years, I've done four in a row horror films again. So, so obviously, I love the genre. I've done nine of them. <laughs> it's it's kind the of jumping from genre really... to genre. Um, I'm looking on, I'm, you know, I'm looking at your filmography, and I noticed that uh, you're working on a picture with uh, Keith Jardine, the ex MMA fighter, called Tabitha. Now, is that also a horror film, or no? That's uh, well, that's. Okay, that uh, we'll see what, what happens there. Um, <clears throat> that started as a short film that someone contacted me about shooting in New Mexico. It's a it's a kind of a crime drama, and um, they sent me the script, and I was going to shoot it last year. It was just a couple days of a short, and then at the last minute they decided to pull the plug and try to make the feature instead. So um, they've worked been working on the feature script and. I, I still haven't even read the feature yet because they're, they're, they're fixing it now. So until I read it and see what's going on, I, I'm not, I don't think they have all the money yet. So it could happen. And I like the fact because it's something different. I did one of the gun, which was kind of a crime drama, neo-noir thriller. So that was, that I, I always like mixing it up. So I, I like the idea of doing something like that. But until I read the script and see exactly you know, how it's playing and what they're open to and what the budget is, I, I'm not, I don't know yet. You know, but I'm tentatively attached to that project yet. And since you're a yeah. fan of the noir cinema, um, who would you say are some of your influences in that genre? Oh, um, well, uh, you know, Robert Ryan. I mean, I loved Out of the Past. Um, uh, there's, uh, the, I mean, it's, it is and it isn't, but um, the uh, Sam Fuller uh, uh, movie, uh, Shock, uh, Shock Corridor, is, is great. Um, Obviously, everyone loves uh, Billy Wilder and Double Indemnity. That was a big influence on, uh, and then later on, you know, Body Heat, you know, Lawrence Kasdan's uh, uh, film noir. Um, but yeah, there, there's there's a bunch of them. I, I mean, I, I I I always appreciated the genre, but I didn't really get into it until the assignment came up, and then uh, there was Mickey Rooney and Quicksand, which was kind of the, one of the inspirations, and then I sort of branched off from there and started watching all these films and. Uh, Detour is really great. Um, you know, then I discovered you know just some wonderful films of, of the genre. In 2017, you got to make a film called The Black Room, which starred almost an all-star cast. I mean, you had Lynn Shay, James Duvall, Gleb Scott, Natasha Hendricks. Um, I mean, the list goes on. How was it making that film with all that talent? Uh, well, that was it. Was great in terms of the cast. Love that. The um, that one was kind of a lucky thing that came about. Uh, I had written the script about 12 years before we made that movie. I had originally written that script 
when, around the time when I did Jacqueline Hyde with uh, Gabrielle Hall. Um, so that it was sort of a sexy horror film, you know, because I was dealing with some of the people from those, those days. Um, but the film never happened. And then I started talking to Cleopatra uh, Records, and they were starting the film division. And they wanted to make a horror film, and some, a few people recommended me, a few of my friends. So I, I met with uh, their development guy, and uh, they said, well, what scripts do you have that can be done for, like, in the $200,000 range? So I, I have a bunch of screenplays, and I said, well, I have this one. It was originally called The Red Room, actually. Um, they liked it. They said, we just want to change the title to The Black Room. I said, fine. And um, then they also wanted some names in it, because this originally was going to be, you know, without the 200 250,000 not a name movie. So they said, who do you see? I said, well, the grandmother would be great to get Lynn Shay. I mean, she's, you know, of course, the top. And they they knew her manager. They reached out. They got her involved. I had a nice lunch with her, and I, I, I which I think she appreciated. I told her, I said, there's only two people who could do this role, in my opinion. It was Ruth Gordon from, you know, Rosemary's Baby, who's long passed away, and you, and, you know, Ruth's not available, so um, she appreciated that, and then we talked about the character, and she got on board and said yes, and then they wanted another, well, so I I knew, um, uh, I knew Dominique Swang for, uh, with the producer, uh, Esther Goodstein, who I've worked with before, she'd worked with Dominique, so I knew I could get to her, I knew James Duvall from Friends, uh, Tiffany Shepless I'd been working with since, you know, the ha- before the hazing, so I knew her as well, so I could fill up some of those roles with people but they wanted another big name. And we were having a really hard time finding someone because it was a new company and the managers and, you know, the, the gatekeepers to these actors, you know, uh, don't believe anything unless it's real, real. And, you know, they would never heard of them. And of course they want the actors to do TV shows because that's where the money is. So we were really uh, not getting through to anyone for the lead, like two weeks before the shoot. And then just so happens, I, I, I live in North Hollywood in California now and I was I went to a CVS up the street from me, and on standing in line right behind me was Natasha Henstridge. And I recognized her, of course. You know, she wasn't dressed up, but it's hard to miss Natasha Henstridge, uh, you know, species. And uh, I, I, I went to one counter, she went to another, and I uh, text the producer saying, I'm standing in line next to Natasha Henstridge. She'd be great for the role of Jennifer, wouldn't she? And they're like, yes, talk to her. And I'm like, what? Geez, talk to her. <laughs> like, just go up to her and talk to her. Yes, yes, you know. <laughs> so I, I waited till I left the store with her, you know, at the same time. And then in the parking lot, I was just very, I said, Natasha Henstridge? She's like, yes. And she was very nice. And I quickly introduced myself and said who I am. And I said, I'm making a movie in two weeks. She goes, two weeks? Yeah, are you available? She's like, well, actually, I am. I, something just fell through. Um, so I, I got her agent's numbers, and um, we, we called them up. And, again, nothing happened. We called four times. They didn't return the phone calls. They didn't get through, nothing. So we had to move on. We're like, well, we're not going to get to her. And then, but I gave her my card in the parking lot. And then five days later, she called me directly and said, you know, I never heard anything from from you guys. Um, What happened? And I said, well, we tried, but your managers. She goes, yeah, that's what I was afraid of because that's what they do. Um, Send me the script directly. So I sent her the script. She gave me her email. And then three days later, she's like, Let's do it. I'm in. And we got Natasha. So cast in the parking lot of CVS. <laughs> and that film had a lot of great actors involved. I mean, you, your career just went on and on. And like I say, you worked with a lot of the best that you see now in big films um, that, and that, that go out and be blockbusters, bigger films and such. And then you just to be able to work with them must have been a great uh, experience. Now, um, what would be some of your most complicated films that you had working on? Like, did you ever have run into any ordeals throughout your career that it just nothing seemed? Well, you probably went through more than one. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, or, no, they're they're, they're all ordeals. ordeals. I mean, <laughs> uh, when you're dealing in the independent world, um, I mean, even that last thing I'm on. So even even the, the Black Room, you know, we we didn't have as much money as you thought we had on that movie. That film was. Uh, a 16 day shoot and uh, you know it was under a half a million dollars I mean again for low low budget of course that's something but when you're dealing with those kind of people and and that's kind of schedule and even I mean still 15 16 days you're 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 moving pretty fast especially when you're doing almost all practical effects on the set which I really believe in and always try to do uh, very little CGI um, you're always up against it, you know, uh, and I, and I'm always trying to do ambitious movies. Uh, they're doable, but they're always pushing the, you know, the limits of what we have access to. So, uh, I mean, 
But the most miserable experience was still Corpses, the one with Jeff Fahey, and not again because of any of the actors. The actors were all wonderful, Tiffany Shepard and Robert Donovan, and everybody's great. But the producer of the time, uh, just nothing was there. Everything was a struggle and a fight, and uh, uh, it was just the worst produced movie I'd ever been on, and um, we had big fights on that thing, and that was pulling teeth. And I, I, I was happy that the film came out at all because there, there was at least a good you know, 30 pages that never got shot in that movie and it had to be restructured. So there's a lot, there's a lot. The movie did not turn out the way I wanted it to be, but I made it work for what it was. Uh, so that's how that was. Um, Party Bus to Hell, uh, that was an 11 day shoot. And that movie, if you've seen it, is packed with stuff, <laughs> with all the people yeah. and the nudity yes. and the gore and the monster and the killings and, uh, and the desert and the windstorms and the sandstorms and, <laughs> it was it was a it was a big challenge in the in the deserts of Vegas, so uh, so that was uh, that was definitely uh, up there with uh, difficulty. Um, you know, and then I've you know I mean some of the those those late night cable things uh, were five six day shoots, so you're shooting on film at the time, twenty twenty five pages a day in twelve hours could not go over twelve hours. And um, you're really trying to, you know, do comedy and and gags and all this stuff, as well as shooting nudity and <laughs> making all this stuff happen. So, I, I mean, the, the, the good thing is, and this is what I'm, unfortunately doesn't really exist anymore, is that I worked I worked for Troma Entertainment back in New York. I worked on Troma's War. I was a PA and a grip and a gaffer. And then when I came out here uh, with the Saritsky stuff, it was in conjunction with Roger Corman. So I met Corman and I got to you know learn the, the the Corman approach. And I also did a little bit of time with Full Moon, um, Charlie Band. So at least I had the training from like you know if you have to make a movie down and dirty, how you do it properly. Uh, which mm-hmm. almost doesn't really exist anymore. I mean, Troma's still around, but Lloyd directs all of his own movies, and Charlie Band directs all of his stuff that he's doing on minuscule budgets. Um, so nowadays, you don't really get that training you know, to build up your your thing. You know, if you if you start from the Michael Bay approach and you have you know four million dollars to do a a commercial, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like well, that's that's nice, um, but you don't know how to you don't know how to get around problems except just throw money at it. So it teaches you how to. You know, really, uh, I mean, John Carpenter said about that, that, you know, having, you, you know, when you're doing big budget movies, you just throw money at the problems. But when you're doing independent, you have to be creative and figure things out. And a lot of times you come up with much better solutions than you ever thought because you didn't have the money to spend. I mean, as Spielberg even said, Jaws would never be Jaws if the shark worked. The fact that it didn't work is why the movie is so great with the POV shots and the music and all that stuff is because they had to work around the problem. Uh, tell me what, we, uh, what did you learn the most working with Lloyd Kaufman and Charles Brand uh, Band because both of them are you know guerrilla filmmakers, but both of them are very different. I mean, I know the Charles Brand uh, shoots are notoriously crazy. Crazy stuff happens, and Lloyd Kaufman is also he's a pioneer who is uh, inspired by uh, Roger Corman. Um, what would you say you learned the most from both of them? Well, Lloyd, I worked more hands-on than Charles Van because um, uh, Charlie, I almost directed a film for. I wrote one that uh, that the filmmaker friend directed, uh, so I was just one of the writers on. So I never really got in the trenches with him. But uh, there was a big difference between the two coasts. L- Lloyd was really guerrilla, like we're just going to steal and grab everything. Charlie's a little more, you know, let's just simplify the story enough so we can shoot it. You know, whereas the the, the uh, Lloyd Coffin approach is is uh, no no just uh, you know just if you have to have someone fall out of a tree just uh, you know pay a taxi driver fifty bucks have him climb up a tree and jump you know <laughs> whereas they wouldn't do it out here in California so the, the New York scene was a little more like <laughs> down and dirty and we're just gonna I mean the, L- Larry Cohen same kind of thing just just go out and shoot it just steal it just you know do it just have a car have a car chase and not tell anyone that you're driving up on the sidewalk and by the time you're done you're you're out of there before the police arrest you. Um, Charlie, I think, was always a little more. You have to get the the permits and the rules, and you you know you have to you have to play by the the games. You just just simplify everything so you don't have to get anyone hurt or in trouble. Um, it, it, it's it's yeah. funny you mention Larry Cohen because he is I, I I consider him such an underrated filmmaker. When you look at films like It's Alive, um, It's Alive, and some of his other films, he's so inspired by that golden 
age of horror from the 30s and the 40s um, that is a, a huge undertone in a lot of his films. Uh, oh yeah, and, you know, he's, and I saw the King Cohen documentary, which is which is great, and you know tells all the stories on that stuff. But no, very talented stuff, and I loved special effects and and uh, Perfect Strangers, some of his Hitchcockian thrillers that he did too. Um, very very creative, and uh, and then of course as a writer with uh, Phone Booth and Cellular, I mean yeah, the guy in television branded. I mean he's and, it, and it's funny career. with Larry Cohen because it's like even when you look at his soundtracks, uh, it scores. Very, very much influenced that by that era. Um, very underrated. It's alive. I consider a super underrated uh, horror. Oh film. yeah, it's well, very look, witty. I mean, it's it's comedic, and it's funny work because with, yeah. It's, yeah, it's funny because a lot of your horror films that you directed are very, you know, it's you know, there's a lot of comedic elements to it. So I guess would you consider Larry Cohen a big influence on you as well? Um, not as much, probably. I mean, I, I appreciate his work, but I never considered his stuff as comedic. As I mean, he, 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 there's humor in all of it, but he played it much straighter. Um, and I was just saying that with It's Alive, you know, the few filmmakers who got the chance to work with Bernard Herrmann, you know, <laughs> that's, that's quite a, quite a person, you know, um, the Hitchcock, you can't get any, any better than Bernard Herrmann and Jerry Goldsmith, so. Uh, but, um, no, I appreciate Larry Cohen's stuff. And uh, I mean, the stuff is actually, that's one of the more over the top with, uh, but he always has great concepts. He, Larry's films, I always said, they have, they have great hooks. They have great ideas. Sometimes the third acts don't follow through. You know, they, he doesn't always have the great ending. I mean, uh, Maniac Cop's a lot of fun too. You know, the script on that one. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I appreciate his stuff, but, um, I I was I was definitely more influenced by Evil Dead 2, Sam Raimi, and um, you know that that kind of uh, little slapsticky kind of humor in there, and John Landis and Blues Brothers, American of London, you know that that kind of mentality. Sam Raimi was also another filmmaker really inspired by Abbott and Costello and Three, yeah, Stooges. Three Stooges. He was the Three Stooges, yeah, yeah. Three Stooges, big time guy. <laughs> that um, Party Bus to Hell, you said it took 16 days to film that. That uh, 11, had 11, awesome, days, 11, 11, <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that, that had awesome cinematography, um, great Michael shots action-wise. I mean, you worked with Tara Reid. How was it working with Tara Reid? Is she, was she great to work with? Tara is a very nice person. Uh, I, I like her. Um, she's, she's cool. She, she got into the spirit of the film and, and had a really good time with the mummies. I mean, she really had fun with that. And she's a good sport because if you saw the end of the movie, we have those bloopers about where she's saying, I hate dummies. She kept getting yeah. stuck on dummies rather than mummies, and, um, you know, she, <laughs> it was kind of funny. Uh, but then I got to work with her again in The Art of the Dead, my, my new film. And, um, no, she's, she's, a, she's a lovely person, and, uh, you know, um, she, yeah, she's... 11, 11 days to bring a movie together that looked that amazing. Um, were you under a lot of pressure with that it film? Was, and I was working with an entire new crew. I'd never worked with any of those people before. It was all Vegas people. So I, I, I wrote the script. They hired me to write the script, and I wasn't originally going to direct it, but then they really kept coming back to me to direct the movie. I wasn't sure, and I knew because the budget was pretty low and the timing, and um, I finally I agreed to do it, uh, and I was just like, well, I'm, I'll go in and I'll do the best I can with what we have to work with, and then... Luckily, Michael Sue, who's a DP they found, who's, who's also from, from Vegas, did an uh, amazing job, and we clicked, and then he also shot Art of the Dead, and it, that's night and day between the two movies, but they both are beautifully shot, and, and uh, I love working with Michael. I, I've been lucky and fortunate enough to work with a couple of very good DPs uh, over the years <laughs> as well. And uh, they share. The funny thing is, though, a lot of people think I always use the same DP because of the style of the movie, but it's like, no, that's me because I basically do a shot list and I have a visual style myself and I, and, the, and when I, if I have a DP that can trust me and, and can work as fast as I need to work, because we have done Nightmare Man, uh, Paul Dang, who I worked with a bunch of times, uh, that movie, uh, it was a 16 hour day, but we did 78 setups, one camera in 16 hours. Wow. So that's up there with the record. And actually I think Party Bus beat it. We had two cameras, but uh, the big massacre scene in Party Bus when everyone gets killed at night, I was I was in charge of two units going simultaneously, and we did over 80 setups that day, and that was and we were killing like 14 people with blood and all practical effects. That was, and it was a, and it was a sandstorm. It was during the it was, it was with smoke machines and oh it was free oh yeah it was just 
I, I, it was the fact I didn't get movie. physically sick doing that, I was very impressed, very, very happy with myself. <laughs> I was able to keep healthy. And, and the other host, uh, Lucian, Lucian is, he loves the genre that you were inspired by. Uh, Lucian, do you have any questions for Mr. Kinski? Uh Yeah, I've got one for you. Uh, give, us a, give us a little peek into your writing process. A peek into my writing process. Um, okay. Uh, well, I, it depends on the, the assignment and the project. Uh, if I'm writing something for myself that's a spec script, uh, sometimes I, I come up with the idea. If I can't get it out of my head and I really feel like I need to write it, I'll just sort of sit down and start to write it. I, I rarely outline it if it's for myself because I like the spontaneity of it and I, and I like to surprise to see where it's going. Um, Nightmare Man's an example of that. When I wrote that script, um, people died in that script that I had no idea were going to die when they died. And I was like, well, that surprised me as a writer. So um, if it surprised me, it should surprise the audience. Um, so the, the nice thing is sometimes if you get into the, the zone, I guess, you, the characters start to write themselves and they, they go off into, into places that you're not even quite sure. And it's, that's a great sensation and feeling. Uh, but a lot of times when I'm given an assignment to write, like a Lifetime movie or a family film or, or one of the other films, um, they want a very you know strict guideline. They'll sometimes give me a, a, a concept, and then they want a beat sheet or a treatment, and then I have to work out the whole thing and then stick pretty closely to it so I don't go off on tangents. Um, and that's when it's just uh, delivering you know what they what they kind of want. Um, I've always been pretty fast as a writer because uh, I kind of get into a tunnel vision mentality where I just, once I start a script, I, I have to finish it. So I don't just write something and then put it aside, usually. Um, only one or two scripts I've done that I ran into a, a problem. And I, uh, there was one script where I knew the end of the script and I had the beginning, but I didn't know the middle act. So I had to wait until I figured it out. I don't jump around on a script. I don't usually use index cards. I just sort of go from beginning to end. And my advice always to writers is that a lot of times, there's a lot of people that want to write but have a lot of prob- problems doing it or they, get, they, they try to make every word perfect so they get like 10, 15 pages into it and then they go back and they rewrite it and they rewrite it and they rewrite it and then finally they give up. And it's like, look, writing is rewriting anyway. Just get through it. Just, just get yourself through the script. You know, at one point you'll always hate it because you always do, but if you can get to the end, it's, it's an accomplishment, it's important, and you'll realize it's probably not as bad as you thought it was, and then you can always go back and fix anything. But if you get stuck on the first 15, 20 pages, you know, that's what, that's what stops so many people from, from getting through something with an idea than, than doing it. And I also say, if you're a filmmaker or a writer or, or whatever, there's, um, if you're trying to get money to do a project, any kind of project, you have to show the, the financiers or the producers that you're responsible for that, so they need to they need to trust you that you are going to complete and and do this film or do this script. So you have to force yourself to get to the end of it, because that is it's uh, it's just important for if you want to make a career in this business to show that you know I'm I'm a responsible professional film writer director whatever. That's so, very yeah. true because I tell a lot of my students the best songs are the ones that come uh, that come the quickest. Um, it's it's sometimes it's just cap, it's about capturing that vibe over just going into that small detail I find at least. Yep. In your um, your newest film that's coming out, uh, Out of the Dead, stars Terry and Richard Grieco and a lot of other great actors in that. Um, and you just wrapped up on that one. You, you finished that one. It was out there. You um, did you had a premiere on it, didn't you? Like a preview of it? Yeah, we just. Uh, um, I, Three weeks ago, I guess two, two, three weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, and I've been following a lot of your stuff out there. And um, how is the um, reception to that film so far? You get from the people that saw it and fans. And well, it's it's okay. Well, it's so far this was a cast and crew and friend screening, so um, everyone was very positive, which was great. And I think they truly did like it. Um, we are looking for distribution now, so we don't have. It's not you know out out yet. It hasn't been released. I'm very pleased with the movie. I think it's one of my strongest horror films. It's not a horror comedy. There is some humor in it, but it is more of a straight horror film. I do think it's got one of the more interesting stories that I that I wrote. Um, the the producers, the same, uh, the Mahal brothers, uh, Michael and Sonny Mahal, that produced the uh, Party Bus to Hell, um, like that one. They came up with the the basic concept of the story, uh, and and then I wrote the screenplay from that. 
So uh, Art of the Dead is about um, an art collector who buys seven paintings at an auction, takes them home to his family, and it turns out that the seven paintings represent the seven deadly sins, and they start to affect the family through greed and pride and envy and sloth and lust and wrath and, you know. <laughs> so it's, a, it's kind of a, a cool premise, and no one's really done the seven, seven deadly sins since uh, seven. Um, but this is a different take on the whole thing and gets kind of surreal. It's it's sort of my homage to the Night Gallery, Rod Sterling's Night Gallery series, um, and has a lot of very cool practical effects and a lot of in-camera tricks that we did. And it's very colorful. It's got a little bit of a Jallo, Argento colorful feel there because it's all about art and paintings and stuff. So I, I think uh, it's, it's going to do well. Um, there's definitely companies that are interested, so it's a matter of finding the best deal. We were just invited to... Uh, have a panel at Monster Palooza, the big, uh, the big horror convention in uh, L.A. In, in April. So uh, we'll probably be there with Jeff Fahey. Um, uh, not Jeff Fahey, sorry. It was <laughs> Richard, Richard Grieco, Richard Grieco um, doing, the, doing a panel about the movie. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's, a cool, it's a cool horror film. Sounds great. You know, you mentioned earlier uh, with practical effects, and we were talking about 35 millimeter earlier. Do you think practical effects is now kind of a – kind of a dying art? Uh, there's a lot of people out there that love it, and I think the more people do it, they, they, people are more appreciative of it. Um, I guess it's the generational thing of where you are. I, I, I think there's just so much CGI and the superhero movies and all this stuff that people are used to that, but, uh, you know, the American World of London transformation still works. That still holds up, I think. I mean, the Fright Night effects, you look at some of these movies that were done well, I mean, when... They, they really are good. They, they test, stand the test of time. You know, I mean, yeah, you compare American Wolf in London to American Wolf in Paris. There's <laughs> no comparison. Night and day. Um, Imagine if they made Gremlins with CGI. Yeah, I know. Right. And, and that's what, yeah, they, they, they do so much of that stuff. So, I, I mean, people will accept it, but I, I, it's so much more organic, and you don't quite know how you do it if you can do it live. Because you can tell that, I mean, I, I have to, you know, give Tom Cruise props for, you know, Mission Impossible Fallout. I mean, when you see Jackie Chan, you see you know, them actually do these stunts for real, it's, it's great. And you can feel it. You're like, this is real. This is actually happening. They're, 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 they are doing this, you know, jump out of an airplane or, you know, racing in, on a motorcycle. Um, you can enhance it with CGI, I think, and you can, if you use it right as a tool to erase wires or do that stuff, but try to keep it as, as live as possible, it's so much better than just relying on everything. Because the performances are always like, you just, it's not that you don't have the danger. You just, you never feel that uh, threat if it's just um, people on a green screen. Now, when you go to your conventions and you go and meet the fans, what is the, the, most heard, like the biggest um, film of yours that they come up to you is about and talk to you about? Was it nothing? There's nothing out there, or is there other things well, out there? Well, nothing out there is growing in reputation. This this Blu-ray release is definitely I'm I'm seeing more love for the film than ever before, and people are really and it looks and sounds great now. I mean, it, it, the 35. Whenever we showed it in the theaters, it was always a great reaction. But you know, the transfers throughout the years were never been great. So this is the first time Vinegar Syndrome really went all out and just did a fantastic uh-huh. job. Um, and, and, did you uh, supervise with the transfer at all? Or? No, no, I was, no, they didn't have me involved with that. I was involved with all the special features and the commentaries and mm-hmm. all that stuff I, I provided. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of that in there. Yeah, I really try to, to build it up with all the bells and whistles. Because I said if people are going to double or triple or you know, dip on this movie, you know, there's got to be a reason for them to do it. I mean, the transfer is great, but also just all these extra features as well is, is cool. Um, and the commentary that I did with uh, you know, Joe Lynch and, and Jeffrey Reddick were, were really nice, and that was, that was something different and cool. But um, for the first time, um, and I stumbled upon this, the, the Alamo Draft House in Houston is uh, screening There's Nothing Out There uh, as a double feature with Scream on March 1st. So I'm going down to the the Houston screening of that, and so is Craig Peck, the uh, the lead for the first time from Ohio. He lives. Uh, we're both going down to, uh, which will be really nice, uh, the first weekend of uh, of March. Um, so that film definitely road trip. Has, what? Road trip. Yeah, yeah. So that film definitely mm-hmm. has its audience. Um, I think the hazing people know. Um, again, more people should than they do, but. The one probably most most people have seen is Nightmare Man because that was part of the eight films to die for. So that opened in 500 screens and, you know, got the most attention of uh, of any of those films there. Now, it's not my most loved film. Um, 
which I think yeah, I, I, I'm proud of the movie. I think it's a good movie. I think Tiffany Shepard is wonderful in it. Um, I just think people again expected a straight horror film, and again, Nightmare Man is kind of a funny horror film. I mean, it's it's a horror film, but there's a good sense of humor, and that's kind of what's plagued my whole career is that people, you know, with horror they expect horror, and when they get horror and humor. If they've gone in with different expectations, they it just strikes them as weird, and they don't quite know what they're watching. So sometimes they just think it's really stupid. Um, then if they change their expectations, they get into the movie, they realize that it's supposed to be funny, and then they can laugh and have a good time with it, and you know, and appreciate it for that. So I think that's again Nightmare Man, and a lot of my movies upon you know second or third viewing, people might actually say, oh yeah, no, I see, I see the jokes, you know. <laughs> And uh, there's nothing out there was was aimed to have was to be that fun experience. I mean, there were scenes like when um, he grabbed hold of the boom mic and swung, or then there was the scenes at the the end was one of the best endings. Very funny when the girl gets in the car and you have green eyes, and then you see the, the van just stop and they threw her out of the car. The van, I mean, that was hysterical. But I mean, the the film itself was a lot of fun to to, to watch as a fan. But to take you back to when you were making that film. Uh, before you made all these other films, you had like that. It was decided on the house, the woods, a good tone, a good atmosphere for horror, and you had this little green creature with these tentacles for arms going after the women and the men and everything. So it was really a, a good, fun film for back in that era of uh, filmmaking, I would think, in, in your take. But um, do you, when fans come up to you and they, they watch this Vinegar Syndrome film, this, this Blu ray copy, it's amazing, like you said, with the sound and the the way they enhanced everything, the special features, they pulled no stops. Um, you have four uh, other little films on this, this Blu-ray of yours. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're all great. But do you look back at that time and you say, would you do it all over again? Would you go back? Oh, yeah. Would well, you, there's nothing you I mean, love to do all over I mean, I was, I mean, I was, I was, like I said, I was 20, it was my first, I was 20 years old, I was, you know, I mean, the, the, there's, the nice thing about There's Nothing Out There was, it was the first time I worked as a professional movie, and I had planned it, I, I mean, if you see all the video storyboards and all those behind the scenes of how we did it, it was, it was, it was worked out to a T, that movie, it wasn't just, you know, improvised, um, and I, for the first time, I had a crew, because all my other films, my home movies, I, it was all just me and friends, and they would flake out, and no one, you know, they, these were people that wanted to be actors. These were actual professional DP. I mean, Ed Hershberger, who shot it, had worked on Brian De Palma Sisters, and he worked on The Prowler. I mean, these were people that were professional. So, I, I, I was my only concern was because I was literally, I was literally the youngest person on the set, <laughs> and but my father was producing it. However. I knew every answer, so if I wasn't worried, if someone came up and had a question, I knew the answer. So they knew that I was making the movie, that this wasn't just, you know, a vanity project for, you know, this, my father's, you know, <laughs> the son. Um, so, I, I, you know, there was a lot of decisions and calls. I, 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 I watched so many movies at that point that I just, I, you know, I, I didn't want to make fun of the horror genre. I wanted to make fun of the lazy conventions and cliches like the cat scare that jumps out of nowhere and, and all these things that had been done to death. I felt that's what I, so I, I, it was a love letter to horror films and it was just making fun of all the stupid laziness without making fun of the genre itself. And that's, I think uh, what comes through and, and people are talking about that more and more today that, you know, that it is very affectionate. You, you like the characters in the movie. You like the people. These are not just, this is not like a, a filmmaker poo pooing the genre and, and just saying, you know, I have no respect for this thing or just treating it as, a stepping stone to bigger and better stuff, saying, okay, I'll do one of these things and you get out of it. I actually really, you know, I, I, I like the audience. I've been going to the Sangori conventions and reading the magazines, and I, and I knew the fans, you know, are rooting for you. They, they want to see a good horror film. They want to like it, but, you know, if you, if, you, if you do stupid things, they'll turn against you and, like, well, that's ridiculous. You're stupid. So that's why, again, I said, I said the horror crowd would appreciate and understand exactly what I was doing. I didn't expect the critics or anybody else to get it because – and then I was happily surprised that actually got good reviews that the L.A. Times and the, and the New York Times, um, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, all those places actually liked the movie because of the humor. Um, so all of that was great at the time, and I was just frustrated that we couldn't get the release because the studios and the and agents in, at the time were like, we don't get it. It's too funny to be scary. It's too scary to be funny. Are people laughing at the film? Are they laughing with the film? I don't understand what it's supposed to be because no one had really done it too much by then. And... 
you know that that's that was what was so uh, annoying but looking back now um yeah the film is exactly the movie i wanted to make i got to make it the way i wanted to make it my father who also edited the film fantastic editor we worked very closely together uh, the pace is good on the movie, and every time I see it in the theaters, the audience over the years, every 10 years it gets re-released, um, the audience loves it. They just appreciate the movie, and it, you know, I said, because <clears throat> my thing was when I was making the movie, I said, you know, you can't, I'm not trying to make a cult movie, because if, if you try to make a cult film, you will fail miserably. You can't try to make a cult film. It just has to happen. So I was just saying, I'm just going to do this film for what it is, and it will appeal to the audience. I hope we'll get it. And, you know, the longevity of its life, we'll see. You know, um, I just try to do the best job I could on it. Um, I'm happy now that, again, it looks so good on Blu-ray. Because I see a lot of reviews online uh, that, that review the, the, the YouTube link, I guess, that's free through Trauma. And they're like, well, the movie's fun, but it's really cheap looking. And it really is just, you know, poorly made. And it's out of focus and all this stuff. And it's like, well, watch the Blu-ray and you'll see actually – it's not, <laughs> you know, it's it's not it's not Hollywood, you know, twenty million dollar Christmas, but it's it's a very well shot, well made movie for what it is, you know, and that's why I've tried with all the films I've done is just to to make them well, to make them as slick and as as professional as as you can, you know. You achieved greatly with that. Um, now, uh, do you you watch a lot of uh, movies today? Like, what is your take on today's standards with films? Um, but especially core and the kind of genres you work with. What are your your take on those? Oh. Um, I yeah, I mean, I, I like uh, there's 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 ones I like, there's ones I don't like. Um, uh, I, I I enjoyed The Quiet Place. I thought it was pretty effective. Um, Heredity had some really great stuff in it, especially the first part of it. Actually, I thought it was very disturbing. Um, reminded me a lot of uh, Don't Look Now, which no one really compares it to, even though it's very similar in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> the, if you know that movie, the Nicholas Rogue film, yeah, that's 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 really yeah, yep, yeah. That was a good one. Um, I I really thought it was surprisingly good. The uh, part one, chapter one of it, um, that one really worked for me as a '80s coming of age story as well as a horror film. And I and I love the original Tim Curry miniseries, you know, too. Um, the new Suspiria didn't do touch too much for me. I really wanted to like the new Halloween, but. It's okay. <laughs> Love the score. Carpenter did a great job on the score. Um, you know, it really comes to depends on which films and not. A lot of times, I find more of the straight to video stuff uh, is the more interesting films. There's one I saw recently, which I, which I did think was surprisingly good. Uh, something called He He's Out There. I thought was an effective little uh, family under siege movie that was kind of disturbing with children, and uh, they did a lot of nice things in it. And then in the comedy horror realm, uh, Tucker and Dale versus Evil is brilliant. Um, no. I really like the Final Girls. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, and, and you know, I, I yeah. <laughs> so there's still there's still good movies being made all the time, you know, which is which is nice. And um, with your um, writing and your directing, um, do you? Like, what strikes you in the mood when you're going out there? Like, when you're, do you, like, have to go for a walk, or do you just sit and think, or do you just take elements around you and it inspires you? Like, what is your biggest inspiration to do? Take out uh, your laptop or whatever and just start writing a script and saying, this is my next film, this is what I'm going to do next. Um, do you have any of those moments? Uh, it's sort of always different. I mean, well, well, one thing, of course, is, you know, getting a job that pays you money, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still, even with... 30 years, I'm a still very struggling independent filmmaker here, um, looking for the next paying, paying job. Um, I, I come up with just, uh, I mean, I, I can, since I love all genres, I mean, I, I do, you know, I watch a lot of the films from the 40s and the 70s and, uh, and you know, all over the place. I love musicals. I, I mean, it's so I, 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 and in the apocalypse was great. I, I, that that got me more excited about like saying I'd really like to do a musical again. You know, it'd be so much fun because I I do love the genre. Uh, <clears throat> I watched a trailer for something and then came up with an idea for a romantic comedy that I thought was very commercial and fun. And I wrote a three page treatment on that. I didn't write the script yet. I some, sometimes it's like, well, let's see if I can get someone who's willing to pay me to write the script versus just sitting down and writing because I've written a lot of scripts over the years. I mean, I have a, a pretty big back catalog of stuff. Um, the last horror script I wrote, uh, I wrote a, a, really, a really fun script called uh, uh, Horror Fest. And um, 
it uh, deals with an interactive horror movie. So it's like kind of a horror mer- version of, uh, you know, Jumanji <laughs> mm-hmm. in a way. Um, and that, I think, would be a, a great script to do for people. You know, I mean, again, I think the genre, the genre and the audience, it's a very meta kind of film, which would be fun. Um, one time, I mean, the, then there's the script I wrote that uh, I just came up with the title and then everyone said, be based on the title, you got to write the script because um, I thought it'd be fun from the director of There's Nothing Out There to write a movie called This Isn't Funny Anymore. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's a it's a it's a splat stick over the top. It all takes place in the woods. A uh, crazy movie that plays on all the cliches and conventions and twists them in very unusual ways. Uh, it's it's to be a real fun movie to make. Um, and then uh, one year when remember that movie Bats came out with Lou Diamond Phillips. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The nineties. Yeah. Yep. I saw that movie and I was like, I didn't care for it. And I, like, left the theater. I said, you know, they've done every kind of animal attack movie except for skunks and squirrels. I said, that's, that's what someone needs to do. Skunks and squirrels, smell the fear and hide your nuts. <laughs> and then I wrote it. I, I, I just, that, I was actually, I was very depressed at the time. I was, I was, I'd done Tomorrow by Midnight and Pretty Cool. One was, you know, my sort of Sundance kind of project about the kids that would take the video store hostage. And I loved that movie, and then Pretty Cool was my teen comedy, and neither of them went anywhere. And I was like, I don't know what to do now. Cause, um, so then I said, you know, usually you start to write a script, and you're trying to write a really good script, you know, but there's no, those never get made. You know, I have all these really good scripts sitting around that just can't get produced for some reason. So let's try to write something really bad. <laughs> so then I thought, okay, what do I have ideas? I said, those oh, skunks and squirrels. I said, yeah, that could be terrible. So <laughs> I sat down, and as I was writing it, again, because I wasn't trying to write a masterpiece, I just was having fun with it. Um, I, I wrote, it turned into a full-length screenplay. It was a real fun thing to write, and I said, you know, this was fun. And then, sure enough, a lot of people wanted it. didn't get made, but a lot of people wanted to read it, but it got me out of my slump. So it, it was kind of freeing. So sometimes you just need to to write, uh, I mean, that's Stephen King or whatever. They say just always write every day, even if it's just like, you know, all work and no play makes Jack a double. You know, you you got to write something just to keep the creative juices flowing. Um, uh, so I've never had a, a problem with that, and I've had to write under strict deadlines. Um, so, uh, but yeah, the inspiration prefer, comes from... But, do you prefer your writing over directing, or do you like them doing both of them? Well, uh, when you're writing a movie script, screenplay, because I haven't written novels. Um, now, with your, if you're a novelist and it's a novel, that's, it's, that's the whole thing in its entirety. I mean, maybe they'll make a movie out of it one day, but that's the universe. A script is the blueprint basically for a movie. So I enjoy the writing process, and you know, you're by yourself, and there's that self-satisfaction you know, when you're done. However, until it's actually made, it's not completed. So you really need to get on the set and make the film, um, and I enjoy the interaction because that's when it comes alive and the actors bring it to life and, and you know, everything. It's a nice, you know, communal effort and stuff. So I really enjoy that. I, I wish I had more fun on the set, but you're always, when you're dealing with low budgets, um, fighting time and money and even big budgets, I guess you are. But, you know, there's so much pressure you're, you can't really enjoy. I, I always try to enjoy the process as much. But I guess we talked about on the, on the commentary track of there's nothing out there and people discuss that i kept saying i want to have is everyone having a good time i always try to make sure the cast is having a good time and people are enjoying themselves i might be miserable but i want everyone else around me to be as happy as possible especially if you're doing long hours and all this kind of stuff so i try to keep it uh, very i never yell on the set i don't lose my temper um you know i just uh, plug along on it so um so seeing the finished film is, is really the, the ultimate thing. If it, if it comes out the way you envisioned it, you know, there's not too many, you know, cooks in the kitchen. Uh, so they're both, they're both in, enjoyable processes. But, you know, writing is a lot quicker and a lot cheaper than directing, and you need a lot of money, and you always, you know, like I said, I love the creative side of the business. I enjoy the technical side of the business. I hate the business side of the business. And, of course, you wind up doing the business side of the business 80% of the time trying to find the funding and find the distribution and get the film out there and get it seen in front of people. You know, it's a catch-22. When I did There's Nothing Out There, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was sending letters to Fangori because it was like, well, well, we'll do a story on the film, but you have to have distribution. It's like, well, I can't get distribution until people know about the movie. Well, we can't give you the press until you have distribution. So it's the catch-22. Well, how do people hear about the movie if they don't want to talk about the movie? <laughs> you know. So and now today, even though it's much easier and cheaper to make movies with all these technologies and cell phones and everything you have, there's so many made that um, people don't pay attention. 
So how do you get your film, you know, seen? Because, you know, there's less and less video stores. The Walmarts are not carrying that many of these independent films. Redbox is few and far. Even Netflix, Netflix does not have the kind of movies, you know, they have a very small selection when you really think about it. So, yeah, you know, Amazon is doing Amazon. the same thing. Exactly. Yeah, they're they're Amazon pulling Amazon movies Amazon out left and right. So how do you yeah. get your film? See, and I've had good movies that have fallen through the cracks, like, Tomorrow by Midnight and uh, and some of the other ones where people just you know don't even know they exist. Um, Do you think it's it's so much easier to make a film that films are just becoming more disposable? Um. Well, there's, there's, and I mean, there's I mean, there's some that are okay. I mean, in the old days, films cost money to make, so. Not everyone can make a movie. The budget of a movie, the, the, the cost of, the, of making the film stopped a lot of people from making the film. So if you, you had a home video camera, you could make your home movies and things like that, but of course that was your training ground. Nowadays, because your training ground can be released in some form, you know, these, these five or $10,000 movies get made, and you know, some of them you know, are not you know, really ready to be seen yet. But uh, you know, everyone wants to jump on board and just, you know, release the, or, you know, to figure out how they can get their film out there. So uh, some of those movies are more disposable. Uh, I, I just think that, you, you know, if you have an opportunity to direct a movie, it's a privilege. And, you know, I think that's why people can appreciate filmmakers like Ed Wood, even if the talent isn't that strong, the desire is there, and the passion is there, and I have to respect that. Um, whereas there are people that I think, just do it to make a quick buck and are just cashing in on something. And there's like, Oh yeah, just, you know, get a little blood, get a, get a couple of, uh, you know, naked breasts out there. And, you know, we have a movie and, uh, some of those films you just watch and like, well, what was the point of this film? You know, if you're, if you're doing something you've seen a thousand times before and you're not bringing anything new to the genre or to the picture, why are you doing it? Uh, so that's always been my thing. I'm always trying to put some spin on it. I mean, it could fall into, I mean, Lifetime, especially, they want cookie-cutter, you know, very, very cookie-cutter movies, but I always, even those, I try to spin it. The first one I did with Anna Lynn McCord, um, uh, the Watch Your Back or Killer Photo, has doesn't follow the formula and did, like, the best, like, of all the movies that they said is one of the most successful ones they'd have, but they still won't take those chances again because they want to do by the numbers. Um, family and kids' films, too, they want to do. Everyone says, you know, they want to do E.T. or, or Goonies, and it's like, oh, yeah, you're going to talk about, you know, Corey Feldman, the, the heroin is kept in the bottom drawer and the cocaine is there and the sex toys are up in the attic. Oh, no, 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 are you crazy? <laughs> oh, E.T., you know, is nothing like that penis breath. You're going to say that in a children's film? No. You know, it's like, yeah, because <laughs> everyone says they want to do that, but it's like you'll never, you know, give it any kind of edge like that because everything has to be, you know, the Dove Foundation, G-rated, G, 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 so nothing, nothing funny particularly because they just want to, you know, keep it as sanitary um, as possible. You have uh... – you have a fan in the chat room. He's from Canada, Jack Chamberlain. He wants to know, are you ever going to give any thought to writing a sequel to There's Nothing Out There, being such, now that being such a surface hit now? Uh, there is a sequel. Um, <laughs> there, I, I wrote a sequel to the script when I was in post-production on There's Nothing Out There, so it was written at the time. Over the years, I tweaked it a little bit, but I do have a script called There's Still Nothing Out There. Uh, the tagline is, if you were afraid of nothing, it's back. <laughs> and it picks up immediately where the first film ends, like right, like Phantasm Two, right where the first movie ends. Um, it's a fun sequel. Uh, I would like to do it. Um, I'm talking to somebody who's interested, possibly if you can get the money together. Uh, you know, the problem with nothing out there is that even though there's more of a fan base, the movie never really made a lot of money. So the people that like it are not enough for probably the investors to put the kind of money to do it properly into it. And I don't want to do a fifteen, twenty thousand dollar sequel. I think that would be silly. Um, I mean, so the script is, you know, has some stuff happen in it, but uh, I think it is a good continuation. Uh, it would be great to get Craig Peck back. I think, you know, he's for it. I'm going to see him, you know, in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, you know, he's a little older now, as we all are, but um, I think I could actually even work around that issue, too. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. I don't know. Um, I'd be up for it if, if I could, you know, capture the same mood and vibe. I mean, I saw some post people said, you know, only if you get the three actors back. It's like, well, you're not going to get the three. But Bonnie Bowers is not going to come back. That's definitely not going to happen. Um, <laughs> but I explain all that, too, why how I work them out pretty well. But I'd like to bring Mike back for, for Craig and uh, – and then I have a story that uh, I think 
is a continuation of what happened in the first movie in a, in a fun way. So never say never. And you have a, a couple of other films that, like I said, um, Out of the Dead is your newest film. Um, are you, is there something like after this, what is your next project? Is it mostly like writing work or are you going to be directing something or are you just waiting at this time? Like you um, said, for, um, previously? I'm the, well, in order to survive in this business, it's always good to try to have as many irons in the fire at the same time. So currently, and that could change every day. Um, I have got two television series that I'm developing, um, one is based on Edgar Allan Poe, which I've been trying to do for a long time, uh, which I think would be cool, modern modern versions of Poe. And another one about witchcraft, which has some very cool people involved in it, and that could be a, a game changer for me if, if that were to happen. But I'm working on the revised Bible and the pilot of that right now. Uh, I was just hired to write a Christmas romantic comedy, which I've never done yet, so I'm up for that, so kind of a you know, hallmarky kind of movie, um, which is a, a, a money thing, but uh, I'll try to make it fun. Uh, and um, I have a, a Hitchcockian thriller in the works that I'm trying to get funding for. I just got uh, Miriam and Olivia Diabo are, are interested and attached to the project that I've been trying to do. I don't know if you know them or not, but Olivia Diabo from The Wonder Years and Star Trek and Greedy, and Miriam was the Bond girl in Living Daylights, Timothy Dalton. Um, oh, so it's kind of a fun uh, Hitchcockian kind of comic comedic thriller um, that just happened two days ago, uh, <laughs> and uh, then I've got my uh, uh, project I've been trying to do for a long time since I worked with Anna Lynn on the Lifetime movie. I got her. I don't know if you know Anna Lynn McCord uh, from uh, Excision, which was wonderful, and, and she's known for Nip Tuck and uh, the redo of uh, 90210 Beverly Hills. Um, yep. But I have a script called Just Listen, which is kind of Rear Window meets Repulsion um, kind of movie uh, that, that I have her attached to star in, which I, I think would be a wonderful film to do. Um, limited locations and just a really strong actress in the center of it. So that's that would be great, you know. <laughs> so plenty of stuff that could happen, but you never know what's going to happen first. Probably the, the, the Christmas movie, because I think they're going to they, they're gonna start shooting this in, in March, so I have about two weeks to, to write the screenplay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you know, a film like Rear Window, I mean, Rear Window itself was a classic, and it was very limited, and it was amazing how it was done. So if you could do a film like that, I'm sure it have a lot of praise behind it. Yeah, I think it's been with a strong actress. I think it could be cool. Yeah, it's like Rear Window, The Conversation with Gene Hackman, and uh, and Repulsion, uh, you know, Catherine Deneuve, uh, Roman Polanski's movie, I think. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool it, 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 it's, a, it's a psychological drama disguised as a Hitchcockian thriller is the best way to say it. Um, and I, I really like the script. <laughs> it's interesting that you bring up those filmmakers because I feel like in the last two to three years, we've seen a kind of a renaissance in horror again. We're seeing movies like Hereditary. We're seeing films like Mother. I, I know you don't like this, this current Suspiria remake, but that got a lot of critical acclaim. Do you think that you're, we're going to start seeing more serious horror films again? Uh, it could be. I mean, I mean, well, it's funny with the horror films. It's they're like I mean, you, you, you know, you saw the cinema scores where it's like people hated uh, um, The Witch, but it made a lot of money, and Hereditary got like a C minus D plus on the cinema scores. But it it did very well for the horror community. So it's one of those. I mean, Get Out was obviously uh, I like that movie a lot. Yeah, you know, uh, Stepford Wise. But the horror community didn't together. like it that much, though. I felt the horror community was the hardest on Get Out. Was hard on Get Out. Uh, they, well, they were appreciate. I mean, it won the Academy Awards. It, it made a lot of money. Uh, I loved Blumhouse. it personally. What? I loved I loved Get Out personally, but I felt like Get Out was one of those horror films that it was. It was praised by critics. Uh, general audiences loved it, but the horror fans didn't really resonate to it like I thought it would. Yeah, because it's a little well. Yeah, I mean, there's the 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 serious horror films are always sort of. I mean, even though everyone wants something new and different, you know, they pay for Halloween. Uh, I, what I've found over the last couple of years uh, is that I, it seems to me that more horror fans are really would rather watch. Uh, Return of the Living Dead for the 900th time than watch a new zombie movie. 
they're like, I want to see what I like, you know. So a lot of the newer films, I mean, there's a few that get out there, like, like Hereditary, that are the exceptions, but so many of these movies people just don't give the time of day to. They're just, uh, you know, before they're all like, oh, excited, the new horror film's coming out. And I was like, well, is it any good? I, you know, I can wait till video. It's all going to hit. It's too expensive. You know, I, you know, let's watch, you know, let's, you know, let's let's watch the first movie. Let's watch the movies from the '80s again. So there's a yeah. lot of uh, retro going on. Is you know, yeah, like like another example, like Mother is another like, and we we talk about this quite often in the uh, on the show. Is like another one. Um, pretty much most horror fans loathe it, but it kind of has that kind of vibe to it. Where ten years from now, it could be kind of seen like a Jodowski film in the sense that you know. Maybe it was a little bit too different. Maybe it was a little bit ahead of its time in the sense. Um, but it's interesting because I feel like horror fans in general, and, and, and you mentioned it earlier, like a second ago, is whenever you give them something different, horror fans are the first to, um, to steer away from it. And that's something I could never really understand. No, and I don't either. I mean, that's, yeah, you, you, you know, everyone wants to, see, you know, they're like, don't, don't just do reboots and retreads and remakes, but... That's, you know, yes, they, that's what gets in the 2000 theaters. Um, I mean, I enjoyed Happy Death Day, and I'm sure the sequel's going to make some money. You know, and okay, Groundhog Day as a slasher film, fine. But, um, again, it's like, it looks like a rehash. Like, okay, we're going to just do it again. We're going to copy it again. And, you know, and, and I'm now I'm, you know, I'm a little disappointed that Blumhouse is now talking about rebooting Friday 13th and trying to do oh, Elm Street. It's like, okay, we, we are successful with Halloween, so now we're going to turn into the next franchise company. And, and you know, like Platinum Dunes did, you know, okay, what, what are we going to do? We're going to do all remakes of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and whatever else. Whereas the, the, the original content, I mean, they were doing a, a great track record of, like, Bring you know low you know three to five million dollars or under budget so you don't you know lose your shirt, and they were being very successful and I thought that was a great outlet. So now who's going to be the next um, company that's going to do that if if uh, if the, the studios are going to go you know they're going to get more uh, I mean now they're going to do the Universal monster movies they got the rights to the Invisible Man and all that stuff so okay great but we're not talking two hundred dollar you know you know to the two million dollar movies anymore now we're going we're going to be the next uh, Dark Castle or whatever. And the, and, and, and the thing that's kind of disappointing was with Halloween, it looks like they're going to make another one. And, and the thing that bothers me the, the, the most about it is the original Halloween is such a tight film. It's yeah. so inspired by Hitchcock. There's so many film inspirations going on in there. And this new one, it doesn't feel like it's been inspired by Hitchcock. It doesn't even feel like it's been inspired by Carpenter. Um, I will say this, it's better than the Rob Zombie one. Yeah, I agree. That's not saying much, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but it's, but it's, it's, it's kind of discouraging because whenever um, I feel like they're, they're trying to push horror in the right direction so the genre can grow with other genres of cinema, it's always pushed away. So. Yeah. Well, they get into this, you know, we want to give the fans everything they like. So, yeah, I mean, Halloween, the new Halloween is, is, a, is, is the same thing. It's a checklist of, of scenes you've seen from the other Halloween movies. There's so many scenes in it that are nods to the other films. But at the same time, it just it, it doesn't really do anything that new on it, you know, and just and by the third act, I thought it just totally fell apart. You know, I, I think the final battle in Halloween H2O is a better final battle than this one. With Jamie Lee Curtis and and, and the characters are very much written like it was like a 2002 film with like a you know your token stoner, oh your yeah, token yeah. slot like I don't know it was just it wasn't intelligent writing at all. I'm not like not that I'm saying that I'm expecting, um, very you know some deep character development, but just something that's not cliched. Yeah. No, it's very cliche, and uh, and this happens on every. I mean, and I, you know, I, I, I do like musicals, and I, I think there's good stuff about Mary Poppins Returns, but it doesn't have the spontaneous uh, spontaneity of the first one. You, you know, you, you watch it, and it's a checklist. Like, okay, we have to do a song that's this, 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 and all this has to happen because everyone knows it from the first movie. And even though we're saying it's a sequel, it really is just a remake disguised as a sequel in a reboot. You know. <laughs> Um, so I, I, you know, that's, that's, but that's always the risk. It's like, how do we appeal, appease the fans of the first film or the, the franchise and, and, you know, you don't give them anything too different. Um, but if you do something different, you know, don't have the doctor kill someone to want to know what it feels like. I mean, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, you'd mentioned earlier Rosemary's Baby and, and that was like, you know, when you watch that today, it still holds up. 
It's still oh, scary. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. It's terrifying. It's yeah. one of those films that when you're watching it, people can relate to it. You don't have to, you know, anyone who's pregnant or in that kind of scenario can relate to it. Exorcist, anyone who has a child that has any kind of problems and they're going from psychiatrist to psychologist can relate to it. It's, I feel horror, the genre general, generally, it works the best when the audience can relate to it. And I feel like there's that disso- uh, dissociation with what's out there where, you know, the general public, when they go see this movie, it's almost like these horror movies are almost made, some of them are almost made just for that group of people right. that like horror movies. Sure, yeah. I mean, that, well, that's, that my last uh, my last three or four horror movies, you know, the last three years, I, I've been on sort of a 70s kick. And, uh, and, and, and the one thing I, you know, I was trying to do stuff that you haven't seen for a long time, but at the same time make nods to the lesser-known movies, uh, a lot of times, so um, you know, Party Bus to Hell is is very much influenced by uh, Race with the Devil, a wonderful uh, you know horror action movie with uh, Peter Fonda and Warren Oates from the 70s, and uh, The Black Room is Mephisto Waltz, another really cool film with Alan Alda and Jacqueline Bisset that people don't really know about that had a sexual element to the whole thing, um, deals with the devil, and now uh, Art of the Dead is is going back to Night Gallery, which again a, a really cool series that people aren't that aware about. You know that, uh, so I'm I'm trying to bring back some of that flavor, saying, okay, now if you like this, check out these other things. Um, I mean, uh, Art of the Dead. There was there was a definite homage to Rosemary's Baby in that movie. You'll you'll see it. It's very obvious. Um, but at the same time, it's it's not just following the numbers of anything. It's trying to play around with formulas and things, and you know, satisfy uh, you know, what I thought horror fans would like, while at the same time giving a story that's a little fresh and different and not just um, by the numbers, you know, thing. And, and earlier you would mentioned uh, De Palma and then you had mentioned Giallo, so then obviously Argento. So obviously you're, you're, you're a huge fan of Hitchcock, I could say, I take oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what would you say is your favorite Hitchcock film? Um, well, I mean, you know, obviously there's the, the suspense thrillers and then there's the horror. Um, I mean, Psycho, of course, is great, but... I guess the, the 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 film I could watch probably over and over again, North by Northwest. I just have that so much fun. That movie is just a yeah. A great I was just watching my laser the Criterion of it. It's so great. It's so great. Oh, it's beautiful. And um, and I've always loved Strange on a Train. I've seen that one so many times, and it's so well done. And the suspense and the roller coaster. I mean, the merry-go-round at the end is just some beautiful stuff there. And then. Uh, you know, Frenzy is one of his scariest ones, and people don't know that one too well. I mean, that's got one of the most brutal strangulations ever put on film, and with nudity, you know, everyone knows Hitchcock nudity. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I mean, The Birds is still very effective. I mean, The Birds is, you know, it's amazing how many Animal Attack movies there have been, and yet there are very few that are really effective, and The Birds is still really effective. That movie does work. Um, so, you know, but the, the thing I love about Hitchcock, again, was that he... Well, first off, he had a great black sense of humor. All of his movies are funny. They, I mean, even the the cycle has a lot of comedy in it, and it works. But he also was always trying to push the envelope and and come up with new stylistic approaches. He would experiment with the camera. He would come up with new ways to shoot things. And you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much you know, but uh, kind of like the dog. Yeah, suspicion with uh, Cary Grant when he's carrying up the milk that might be poisoned, and Hitchcock put a little EDL light in the milk. You know, so so would we glow from the inside? You can't see it, but your eyes are riveted on the milk, um, and just all these different tricks to to get your attention. And and I love that. And uh, and that was again Art of the Dead. I did a lot of of in camera things where, you know, it's like you know, how did you shoot that? You know, what was that? And we're you know, we're using, you know, smoke and mirrors. You know, you know, I've used bendable mirrors. I've used um, you know slow motion. I used. Uh, um, you know, uh, different kinds of uh, distortion lenses in front of the camera, and you know, you know, there's one really cool shot in in the movie where they're looking at a painting that's a, a pond painting with toads, and uh, someone's kind of trapped inside the painting, and we have the POV from inside the painting, and you see it basically in, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, inside the water, and we put. A diffusion lens, you know, on the camera. We did it in slow motion, and then we put a, a fish tank kind of thing in front of the camera with a tube going around the side that we blew bubbles into, so the water's swirling, and she's moving up to the glass and putting her hand on the glass. 
and it's all done practical live in camera, and it looks wonderful. It's a beautiful, beautiful shot, and it you know didn't cost any money except for the creativity of how to come up with the shot. Whereas you watch it, you probably think like, oh, that's all post production slow motion, and then they probably put the bubbles in on post and that CGI, and like, no, nope, it's all practical, it's all live, and it wow. all works. You know. <laughs> And uh, is there any appearances coming up that you'll be attending, like conventions or anything? Well, the, I said the um, uh, April uh, in uh, the uh, the, the uh, Burbank uh, Marriott Hotel. Um, I'll be at the Monster Palooza on on April thirteenth with uh, some of the cast and crew from uh, Art of the Dead. Uh, and I'll probably also be signing um, at the Vinegar Syndrome table. Uh, there's nothing out there at that point. I'm going down to Houston for the uh, the, the, the special double feature of, of Nothing Out There and uh, Scream on March 1st. So I'll be in Houston for like three days. So that's fun. Um, that's right now the two appearances I know about. I'm always open. So, you know, you know. I've rarely been invited to the circuits and things like that. I mean, Tiffany Shepard does all of them, and, um, you know, she's great at it. But uh, people rarely reach out to the directors, I guess, unless you're – big name director so i'd always be happy to go to him i love talking to people and discussing horror and i'm obviously a big fan of it also uh but at the same time if i'm not doing that i'm hoping to be creating more movies and writing more scripts and uh you know giving you more things to look forward to in the future <laughs> and uh, what about uh promotional like sites and such do you have any websites or uh, any sites that you want to aim towards the audience <laughs> listening I have uh, there's 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 a Rolfsnevsky dot com. There's a little bit of stuff on that, not not too much. It used to be more elaborate, but uh, uh, it's, it, it's been toned back. Um, I'm on Facebook. You know, it's easy to find me on Facebook. I, I post that. I probably do the most posting on Facebook. You know, just to let people know what I'm up to and announcing screenings and events and who's picking up which films and when they're getting released. So uh, so that's um, you know that's one thing. Uh, yeah, that's. that's I strongly want to promote the uh, vin- uh, Vinegar Syndrome with uh, There's Nothing Out There Blu-ray. I mean, it's the best 20 bucks you can spend. Chock full of extras. I mean, this thing is so many extras in it, from interviews to um, behind the scenes to your short films. And I mean, there's so much about the film in this, this one little D- uh, Blu-ray. It's amazing. Yeah. And I'm so excited that my father, Victor Konevsky, is is featured on it. We have a almost an hour long conversation about working together, and then, yeah, my friend uh, C. Courtney Joyner, a filmmaker, and uh, he wrote Prison and uh, you know, Puppet Master Three and uh, many others. Uh, director here, he uh, he interviewed Prison my father. The Rennie Harlan, Prison. What was that? The uh, the Rennie Harlan movie, Prison. Yeah, the Rennie Harlan movie, Prison. Oh, yeah. cool, cool. Yeah, he's a good friend of mine, and he interviewed my father for about 30 minutes talking about his career and, and going back to my father editing Blood Sucking Freaks, the infamous Joel M. Reed movie, and uh, he also was post-supervisor on Just Before Dawn, and he did uh, Blood Bath, Joel M. Reed's Blood Bath, um, Ganjan Hess, which is sort of a famous film, the one that Spike Lee recently remade as a, you know his, his Netflix movie. Um so yeah, my father's been in the business for a long time, and that's really cool to get him front and center to talk about his career too. And this is the only uh, the Blu-ray is the only place you can see uh, Murder in Winter, which was one of your early features. <laughs> my um, high school senior project. Yep. <laughs> yep. And uh, you can see Copycat, which was a short film by you. Uh, Just listen and. Uh, well, sort of Copycat short film about about the history of There's Nothing Out There. It's a uh, a British uh, filmmaker named Charlie Lane. Um, contacted me because um, he just loves There's Nothing Out There and the whole Scream thing, and he interviewed me one day and then turned it into this nine-minute documentary short about the history of There's Nothing Out There and the connection to Scream or, you know, whether it is or isn't. Um, and it played a lot of film festivals and won awards, and it's really cool. So it's nice for that to be on there, too. So you listening, go out there and buy your copy. And I guess in the <laughs> I mean, it's 20 bucks. You get on Amazon. You can get it directly from the. I mean, you can get so many places, but I mean, it's the best twenty dollars you can invest while Blu-ray. There's movie. about thirteen hours worth of content on this thing, so yeah, it's it's pretty loaded. <laughs> if you count the four commentaries. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is there any um, anything you want to give uh, speak out to any of the uh, to the early uh, filmmakers, people who want to go into filmmaking and writing? Is there any advice you want to give them? Well, I always say, um, you know, uh, finish what you start. I mean. Don't get uh, don't get put down by you know it, 
you know, the the the, the old thing is that it, to make a movie, okay, <laughs> there's the one saying if you if you are able to make a movie, any movie should be able. If you have a finished film, you should win an award, and if it turns out to be good, it's a miracle. Um, so you know, don't let all the naysayers and people. If you want to make a film, just go out and make the film. Uh, I I studied film in college a little bit, but I pretty much was fighting with the teachers because I went to Hampshire and. You know, they hate horror films. So when I was 20 years old, I took a semester off because I was still in college, and they, my advisor read the script and said, you know, you're not going to learn anything from making this movie because it was a horror film. And then I came back, and I finished the movie, and I was in post, and I said, you know, I think I, I learned something from making this film. And they said, well, why don't you write down what you think you learned, and maybe we'll give you some credit. Because I wasn't going to get any credit for it. I'm majoring in film, and I wasn't getting credit. So I wrote a 144-page book on the making of nothing called Making Nothing at the Age of 20. And um, it just that was too aspiring filmmakers out there just like you know this is how i did it and this is you know and it was just you know very simple out there to those people so you know any you know you can make a movie you just uh you know but don't you know if you start to think of how overwhelming it is you have to be pretty much have like blind optimism but that's good you know because if you start to think about it you're going to say i can't do that that's just too overwhelming but you just jump into it and somehow you do it you know um you know, I, 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 when I did this, this crazy musical, which was, was insane, the producer said, how are you going to pull this off? I said, sheer willpower. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. you know, that was it. We did it. It's like, I want to do a musical. I'm going to do a musical. You know, it's like, so any film, short, you know, thing you do, the more you do, the better you get, you know. Uh, and, and keep in mind, too, that, you know, back in, you know, Hitchcock didn't start with Psycho. You know, he he made... Tons of movies, you know, silent films, The Lodger, all these films that were, you know, while he was building up his craft. Nowadays, people are like, you know, if you don't hit a home run in your first or second time out, your your career is done, um, which is which is not really true. You know, I mean, yes, if you're doing a two hundred million dollar studio film, maybe, but you know, if you're doing your own projects, you, the, you know, as you, the more you do, the better you get. You learn your craft as you do it. I mean. When Kurosawa won that uh, the Oscar for Life Achievement Award at the age of what eighty six or eighty seven, he said, "I'm I'm just I'm still learning. I'm just getting started." So, you know that that's a great uh, you know thing for everyone to keep in mind that you need to, you know, if you want to, if you you do it because you have to do it. You know, if you're doing it just to make money, and I mean, you might be able to succeed, but you really should have a passion. And you know, it's always like if you want to be a writer or a filmmaker, it's almost like. You can't do anything else. You're doing it because it's it, cause there's a lot of rejection, not being an actor or any of that stuff, and you just constantly come up against it. But you really just, I want to do this thing, and I'm not going to listen to anybody else, and I'm just going to do it and, and, and keep pushing forwards. And those who stay in it the longest are the ones who usually eventually get somewhere. You know, don't, if, you, if you're going to move to, I always say, if you're going to move to California, you have to give at least three years. Don't expect you to be an overnight success. You know, it takes at least three years, and then you can kind of see where it's going. And you know, if you get lucky, yeah, and you need luck. Luck is a big part of it, but uh, there's also the talent and dedication and skill, and um, you know, um, that that amounts to a lot too. And networking, networking, probably better than anything else. The only reason I'd say film schools are good is for the networking possibilities because you want to meet like-minded people who have the same agenda. It's been said too, you know, everyone has an agenda, so you just got to find someone whose agenda matches yours, and then you'll find a good partner. Um, you know, so there's there's lots of stuff. There's um, I've been in three or four screenwriting books. So if you if you want to read uh, the High Concept Massacre, um, I talk a lot about that. There's also Q and A, the Working Screenwriter, and I was interviewed asking tons of questions about how you do it in the writing process and all that kind of stuff. So there are a few books out there too that are that are recommended. But um, not everything works different for everybody else. There's no one rule of how to do it. You know? um, so keep that in mind also. It, 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 every, some people listen to music when they're writing or creating. Some people need total silence. Some people, like you said, walk around to get an idea. Some people just have to you know, be in a party, and the more you know, interaction you have, you know, suddenly things will click. And you'll meet someone. People travel around the world and then come back with you know, ideas. So there, there's, you know, the, the only rule is there is no rule. And remember, in film, nobody knows anything, really. (laughs) Everyone will talk like they're an expert, but nobody really knows. And there's no one way that works and doesn't work. It's always different. It was wonderful having you as a guest tonight. tonight. And like I said, you did so many great films. 
um, and you're going to continue on doing so many great films, whether writing or directing, and always looking forward to seeing them. And there's a lot of listeners tonight, so we had a lot of listeners from Russia, Canada, United oh, States, great. Brazil, Japan, China. We have a, a good listening base tonight. And oh, um, it was just, I think well, you of course, if anyone has money, I, you know, I've got projects too. So there's, <laughs> <laughs> I've got some great movies to, to make. If anyone's out there is like <laughs> sitting on just a load of cash that they need to get rid of for the taxes, you know. <laughs> hey, back, yep, back, to back, good, back, back to networking. Hey. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, but, um, well, awesome. That was a lot of fun. Again. And uh, and I hope to have you on the show again in the future. And like I said, there's so many things we can talk about. Um, you did so many and so much in the film world and still doing it, and uh, so much influence uh, influence from you worked with a lot of the best. And I thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, yeah, hopefully more people get a chance to see more of my movies and uh, keep an eye out for Art of the Dead. I'm hoping it comes out towards the end of this year, you know. And uh, nothing out there definitely is there, <laughs> so uh, we'll see what happens next. Um, awesome. And thank you, and you have a great night, Mr. Kaninsky. You guys too. Okay. Thanks, guys. Good night. All right, good night. Yeah. Bye. And that was a, a great guest we had on tonight, very knowledgeable in film and such. And I really enjoyed it. How did you guys enjoy it tonight? It was fun. Oh, great. Yeah. It was a good listen. So, so how have you guys been doing? Um, I know we lost uh, uh, Julie Adams recently, uh, Dick Miller last week. Uh, we lost a couple of greats in the film world. Lucian had a couple of things he wanted to talk about with uh, Dick Miller. Oh, yeah. Uh, phenomenal list of credits going all the way back. He was part of what they used to call the Roger Corman Stock Company because he was in so many of Corman's early films. Uh, the original uh, Little Shop of Horrors, he appeared in that. And uh trying to get my notes together here. And uh, he, he, he had a record of appearing in – so many, you know, noteworthy sci-fi horror films over the years. Uh, he appeared in Not of This Earth. Uh, let's see. Please bear with me here. Uh, War of the Satellites, that was another film. He appeared in uh, The Undead. Oh, gosh, just so many. A total of 182 film credits to his uh, to his name. He even appeared in a music video with uh, Rod Stewart uh, for the song Infatuation. And uh, that got him some that got him some uh, attention then. And uh, he finished his most recent film credit uh, within the last couple, last month or so. He's in the horror film Hanukkah playing the playing Rabbi Walter Paisley. And uh, the name Walter Paisley, he played that character, but well, played a character Howling. by that name numerous times throughout his career. Uh, yeah, he was he in also, the, the Howling, yeah, I know, yeah. I didn't realize howling. that. Either. And uh, he was also in, he also appeared in every one of Joe Dante's films. He was in Matinee, which is a personal favorite of mine. I love that film. Matinee is a very Again. underrated movie, uh, Lucien. That's interesting that you mention it. That still doesn't – Keith, do you know whether that has a release on DVD still or, like, I mean, uh, Blu-ray at all? Or? Um, it did come out on Blu-ray, I believe, um, within the past couple of months. I don't think so, out. man. I think if it did, well, I, I it thought just I thought, I thought, I thought uh, Didn't Shout Factory put that one out? If it if it did if they did, it's recent. Great movie though. Oh yeah. No, it was a really good movie. Yeah, but yeah, we lost him and we lost the uh, great Julianne Adams also. I keep saying I want to say Julie Andrews, and I don't that whole thing. When I heard she died, I looked up Julie Julie Andrews instead, and it's a good thing I got corrected on that because that would have been a whole can of beans opened up there on the show. Uh, but no, Julie Adams passed away from the Creature from the Black Lagoon. She was a wonderful actress. Quite the looker, I might add. Let me ask you, how you been, brother? Oh, I've been good. Uh, It's been a very down time because I lost my grandmother a couple of days ago. 
So I've been oh, wow. dealing with here. that situation. That, but um, other than that, it's been really good. Um, been really busy around doing things. Um, also uh, tinkering with some games and doing some writing, a uh, mixture of a lot of things. How about yourself with your music? It's been it sounds like it's been taking off, and you're always busy with it. You know, to be honest with you guys, I've I don't know maybe I don't know if you guys have noticed I've been kind of uh, I've been a little bit more quiet this episode. Uh, it's been just a whirlwind, man. I'm just like you know my head is spinning. I've been you know every day it feels like I have some kind of you know interview I have to do. I have to get something ready. I'm always next getting ready for the next release and it's a little bit overstimulating for the brain. You know, you, after a while you get sick and tired of talking about yourself. Uh, you know, you get sick and tired about hearing about you, you know what I mean? All the time, 24 seven people messaging you asking, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm very appreciative of it. And I'm very grateful. I worked my, um, my whole career towards it, but it does get a little bit overwhelming. Um, that's why I love the show, to be honest, because I get to talk about my passion, you know, which is cinema. I get to talk to you guys and I get to pick other people's brains, which, which in turn helps me, uh, with my creative process. And it doesn't, you know, keeps me kind of sane, you know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, everything's been really good. I feel really happy, you know, um, I'm going on tour very, very soon. Uh, in June and in August, I'm going to be going for four weeks at a time. So I'm looking forward to that. Kind of not looking forward to it and looking forward to it because I love being at home. I love being with my uh, my wife and my son. And I love talking to yeah. you guys. I still think, I'm pretty sure I still can do the show with you guys overseas uh, because it's a telephone anyway. So, uh, and it's a Wednesday. And, and, and there's no real you? parties on Wednesday. So, what'd you say, uh, Keith? You know, How's Lucian been? I was going to say, give me a say. Based on what we know about long distance from Australia, you might want to take a lot of pocket change with you if you're going to make long distance calls. Yeah, um, no, I'm okay. Yeah. My plan can, my plan can handle it. <laughs> but uh, did that show last week, it was really tough. Uh, no, as for myself, I'm just you know doing the uh, doing the work a day thing. Uh, don't really have anything lined up artistically. Uh, I have heard uh, recently from the uh, owner slash creative director of the haunted attraction that I act at uh, during October, and they want me to come in for some costume fittings once they're ready uh, because they want to uh, really uh, you know, ex- expand the format of the show that we're going to put on. Uh, they've got an idea. Was it the second season of American Horror Story that was set in a hospital? Yeah, Asylum. Yeah, they want me to do a character like the lead doctor in that. Mm-hmm. And Keith, let sure. me ask you, have you seen any good films lately? Um, I watched Overlord last night. J.J. Abrams. Oh, shit. Oh, how would you like it? What did you think of it? Uh, I liked it. I thought it was it was a fun film to watch. It wasn't a, a big blockbuster, but it was a fun film to watch. Um, I finally watched Death House with all the horror actors in it. I, I like the idea of having all, all, the, all the horror actors in it, written by Gunnar Hansen. Uh, Dee Wallace was in it. Kane Hodder was in it. Uh, um, there's so many. Everybody was in it. Okay, but, so um, I hate to I cut you like, off. I hate to cut you off, but it's I, but I was meaning to touch this touch on this last week, and I didn't. I, and now that you mentioned Dee Wallace, I don't want to. I don't want to forget on talking about this with you. Um, mm-hmm. I watched. Um, I, oh, what was the movie? Uh, it was the Ty West movie, uh, House of the Devil. I seen House of the Devil again. For the, I'd seen it a long time ago, and I'll be honest with you, when I watched it, I was really, really inebriated. Uh, these were the days when I used to really get fucked up. So I don't remember the movie very well, so I watched it again. And um, I think, when, when did that movie come out? 2012, uh, Keith? Uh, yes, around that time. Okay. 
Yeah. So 2013 is when I got clean. 2013, we're in 2019. So it's been a really long time since I've seen it. And I watched it again. And Keith, what did you think of the film? I really want to know what you think of the film. It was uh, like I, I, I was watching the, it for the first I, time. I really want to know I your take on it. I love the film. The reason why I love the film is I love the atmosphere and the mood. It had that sense of like, okay, um, take the beginning part of When a Stranger Calls and then take away the phone calls and the girls isolated in the house. Then you have the the whole cult faction. Then you have the person upstairs, which you don't know who's upstairs. Then you have all the little, um, like the part when her, her friend was parked in the car smoking a cigarette and the guy just shows up and just, just shoots her in the head. I mean, that came out of nowhere. That was just amazing. I mean, I, I loved the film. I thought it was really intense. It was good suspense. Um, I liked the way it was shot. Um, I liked the, the atmosphere of it. It gave you that whole um, 80s feel in some way. Um, I liked it. You know, it's interesting. Okay, this is what I thought of it, watching it again. I thought the first 70 minutes of it was fucking awesome. I'm, uh, I don't know if we can use the word fuck on here. I, I always forget. But, no, we we, we, we um, look and say it. Yeah, no, okay. So I thought it was great. But I felt like the ending, like I was ready for the some end, the sort, ending was too, And I'm one of those The ending was too lucky. rushed. It was too rushed. At the I end. felt like, dude, they stayed there with so much suspense. And like you said, Keith, they captured that era uh, of the 80s so well. Um, they did everything to the T, you know, so well. And then I felt like the payoff, and I'm saying payoff, like that's a wrestling term. But the payoff mm-hmm. was just not there. I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's what the whole film is about. Like I was some waiting for something much more. Now, that being said, the first 70 minutes of it was so tense. Um, I just felt like the payoff was just not there. Um, and it's interesting going to Ty West film, um, the one movie, and I don't know whether uh, you've seen it or not, and I'm not going to say The Innkeepers. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of The Innkeepers, but I was a fan of a little movie he, he made called The Sacrament. And I don't know, have you seen it, Keith? Oh, yeah. I, and I, 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 I love all his films. I like Typothermia. Okay, so let's so talk about The little... Sacrament. What did you think of that? Like I say, it, that that had a good pay, uh, not a payoff, but it had a good follow up, a good build. Um, the thing about the director, I noticed in all his films, he knows how to slowly take you into the story. He knows how to slowly guide you through the story. It's like a, um, uh, it's like he's like a, a tour guide and he's guiding you through all these plots and all the storyline and so forth until the final ending. That one there was a really good film. Um, the yeah, I think Sacrament. I, really I think Sacrament was. Criminally, like I saw it back, uh, I saw it at the Toronto Film Festival when it when it had its world debut, and I I, I was one of those people who thought that was one of the best films, top ten best films of the year. Yep. And I it's loved it. interesting because Sacrament <laughs> has that Italian horror vibe to it. It has that very mm-hmm. Italian horror vibe to it, uh, where you know it starts off you know in the big city. Then they go out into like the safari, and then it has this whole cult. Uh, and I know it's really, uh, it's really based and on that John, cult. John Jobs. Um, yes, sir. You know, the, yeah, you know John Jobs, the Kool Aid drinking. And I thought like the performances were amazing. the The film was at a very high caliber. I, I honestly consider that some high art. And Ty West is one of those guys, man. And, you're, and, and you'll hear me here on the show. He's not, like, I understand, look, his first movie, or House of the Devil, was 2012. It's not like this guy's like a newcomer, but that guy's mm-hmm. going to make something very special very soon. He's well, just see, on he that also, He's also, and a lot of people don't know this in the video game world, he's also a big influence in Behind Until Dawn. If you notice, there's a scene of Until Dawn. No, I know. You, said, you mentioned when, that. Yeah, no, I know yeah, that. I know that. As a character, Until Dawn was one of the favorite room. video games. Yeah, all the posters in that room in the game are his films, Hypothermia, uh, House of the Devil, Innkeepers. They all put him into the game. 
I think so that Ty was, West. Just of that. I think Ty West. He shows brill, like he shows that he can work with actors very well. Ty West is going to be, and you mark my words on this, okay? Ty West is not one of those filmmakers that I think that is. Yes, he's ten years, almost ten years deep into his filmmaking career. But Ty West is going to make something very special in the next five years. I don't know it. I don't know what he has in development at the very moment. But man, can that guy work with actors? He knows how to work with actors. He understands suspense. I think he needs the right script. Maybe he doesn't write his script. Maybe he gets the right script. Maybe he collaborates with someone and he makes something real special because I know that he's known. I know that he has a following. I know he's ten, almost 10 years deep in the game, but that guy's best work is still to, still to come. I, I really believe in that. And he also, he like, he's evo, uh, um, uh episode for the Screen TV show, um, Cabin Fever 2, um, like House of the Devil. But, I mean, like, I'm a really big fan of his work. I love his work. work. And, and uh, uh, another he, thing is, uh, just so you guys know, that uh, KFC has a promotion right now, 20, 20 piece popcorn chicken for $2. So, I thought I would throw to that KFC. Out there. I'm just joking. I just thought I would throw that out there. <laughs> the preceding but, um, commercial endorsement. <laughs> yeah, Lucian has been dealing with weather just like I have. I just got a cold off the damn stuff. It's, it goes to the 70s, the 50s, then it goes into the 20s. Um, how's the weather where you are up here in Canada? Well, I'm in Canada, dude. Uh, there was an ice storm today, <laughs> which is kind of good because – kind of good and bad. Um, I – I I, uh, I I basically work on my own, so you know I, I work. Uh, you know, music is my full time career, so I'm usually in the studio writing music. Uh, but the next couple of weeks, I've pretty much taken off from writing music, and uh, you know, pretty much uh, just been to be honest with you guys, not watching any movies because I know once I watch movies, I get inspired to write music. And I haven't really been playing much video games. I've been sleeping. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I've been, because I've been at such a I've manic been, pace. Yeah. I, I have this new thing going on. I bought, went out and bought these uh, classic minis, Nintendo, Super Nintendo. I bought the PlayStation Classic Mini. And I, sh- I don't know if I should be saying this on the year and that. I've been just toying with them. And yesterday I was toying with the PlayStation Classic. And I opened up a whole capacity of what it can do with the retro gaming and there's a ROM that can play any kind of game on there ever and it's amazing on this little tiny little system so I've been just new oh, the PlayStation Mini? Stuff. yeah oh yeah no I've heard about that you know I'm gonna get that key um I've heard about that but yeah, yeah. man I've been doing not new- much man and 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 and, and oh, but back to what you were saying the, the weather here is insane dude it is minus 20 I don't know what that yeah. works out for you guys in Fahrenheit and stuff. No, um, I think we should have dealt with cold. that last week. Um, it's very, very cold. Um, we also had it last week where it was like minus 20. Um, it, there was so much snow. We got, a, we got so much snowfall on Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That there was the biggest snowfall in Toronto uh, in 51 years, dude. That says a lot. Uh, I live in Canada, so so um, it was so bad, guys, that my snowblower broke, okay? Good and my snowblower broke, and then I realized, shit, my snowblower broke, and my only backup shovel is a cheap dollar store shovel. So now I'm in this thing where I'm like, okay, I'm looking at my neighbor's driveways. They're all clear, perfect perfectly clear and my driveway looks like um bigfoot's uh home um it, you know what i mean and i'm like sitting here i'm like do i sit here and break my back or do i just let it sit there and hopefully it's gonna melt because you know what eventually it will Well, that was a pretty stupid mistake because what happened was it just got colder, okay? So it got to the point where it was so bad that I couldn't get my cars out, and I had to literally – I was just like, you know what, man? I'm just going to – 
call a service and they're gonna they're gonna they're just gonna be able to uh pay you know just clear clear my driveway because i'm because i'm not I'm, I'm sorry i'm not gonna slip a disc uh in order to uh look good to my neighbors and we only uh, have, um we are, we're down to 20 seconds now oh we're down so to 20 seconds okay guys sorry about that time's flying time's flying right by um and uh, like I say, next week we have Chris Greenaway joining us, another director, um, independent from Canada. But um, until until next week, we had a great show today. You have a great night, everyone.